the topic, uh, well, the topics I'm going to cover today, um, the first part of the session, I'm going to look at um, how we think about uncertainties in our models and um, how we propagate uncertainties in parameters through to uncertainties in predictions. I mean, I'm going back right to the very uh, first few remarks I made on Monday, which does seem an awfully long time ago now, about models being robust and being um, extrapolatable. And um, I think part of understanding whether or not our models are robust is being able to think about the uncertainties that are inherent in the models. I mean, this is not unique to our field. I mean, if you, if you, um, if you follow climate science at all, you'll know that you know, climate modelers have to um, um, include uncertainties on their predictions. There's always a level of confidence given uh, with climate models. But actually, in engineering, I think we're probably not as, as good as they are at doing that. And I think it's something that we should be better at, actually. Um, so the first is about tracking uncertainties in our predictions. Um, the second part is going to be about um, how we um, think about reducing those uncertainties. So how can we understand where those uncertainties are coming from um, using things like sensitivity analysis? And then how can we use wider optimi optimization to constrain our models better? Uh, and then um, in the, uh, probably in the last session, um, I'm going to talk about model reduction strategies. So how can we think about incorporating chemical models into um, more complex codes? So I suppose most of the people who are interested in CFD are probably uh, next door with, with uh, Thierry Poisson. But um, we'll be thinking about how we reduce the effort in including chemistry in our models. So I think it's fair to say that if we see experimental data um, in a paper, um, or even in a student assignment, we expect to see some error bars on that data. Uh, it's very unusual to see experimental data without some estimation of the uncertainties that are involved. Uh, but actually, most of the time, when we see modeling in papers, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we, we see experimental data with error bars, and then we see a line, which is the model going through that data. And then we're just kind of eyeballing and saying, well, how good do we think our model is at reproducing that data? Is it close to the symbols or within the error bars or not? Um, but we don't, we don't very often actually see error bars on the model itself. And yet, um, I mean, through the week, we've been looking at how we parameterize models and the, you know, the, the number of different parameters that we might have in some of these complex models. And, and also um, acknowledging that sometimes... Um, their estimates, their, their clever estimates may be using group additivity or using um, reaction rate rules, but they, they're, they're not detailed measurements or high-level theory. And so there will be some uncertainty associated with those parameters. And actually, in terms of understanding the robustness of our model, we should be able to express the error bar in our model. Um, so what are the methods by which we might do that? Um, it's a field called uncertainty quantification, and actually I learned this week that there's a whole new journal on this topic which I wasn't uh, aware of. So um, it is a growing field, um, and it's growing. it has been growing over the years in combustion. Um, so what are the steps that we might take in terms of quantifying the uncertainty in our models? I mean, first of all, we need to estimate the uncertainties in the input parameters themselves. Um, so, I mean, I, I gave some examples. I think there were shock tube examples earlier in the week where estimates are given of what the overall uncertainty is in a rate constant. Um, and uh, historically, um, probably before your time, there was, there was human groups of people who, who went through evaluating kinetic data and estimating uncertainties for those. Actually, that was led by uh, Professor at Leeds, Don Bolsch. Um, so, um, but the information is patchy, I think it's fair to say. Um, well, also, we might need to think about uncertainties in our mo model structure. I mean, particularly in chemical systems. Um, you know, sometimes when we're, we're creating models for new fuels, we don't know that we've got all the reaction pathways that actually might take place in, in reality. And so our model structure actually might also be uncertain. There might be pathways that are missing. We may have physical information that we're missing. Um, so, for example, um, temperature profiles or um, war reactions, heat loss, these kind of things. So there are um, 
you know, there's a wide range of things uh, which might create uncertainty in the models. Okay, so once we've got um, some estimates of what the uncertainties in our inputs are, then we need efficient methods of propagating those through the model to give us an error bar on our predictions. Um, and that, I suppose, it, it's not that straightforward. There's a computational cost in doing that. Okay, so I'm going to start by thinking about the sources of um, in, in uncertainty information for our models. So, um, going back many years to when I was a PhD student and before, um, there was a group of um, scientists, both in combustion and in atmospheric um, kinetics, who used to gather together to evaluate. I mean, I suppose in those days, theory was probably um, not at the high level that we, we see now, but so mainly to evaluate experimental measurements on particular reaction rate constants. But I, mean, I don't know if any of you have ever consulted these, these reference data books, yeah. So um, to, to look at all the data and to make judgments about, um, you know, uh, the, I guess the provenance of the different data sources and to estimate um, where necessary a temperature-dependent uncertainty on the rate constants. Um, so I'll, I'll just move forward and then I'll come back again. Um, so this would be a sort of, uh, you know, a couple of examples actually um, from um, Bolsch data from 1994. Okay, so you, so um, presenting this in the usual way, a log of the predicted rate constant against, um, well, actually this is, yeah, so the inverse of the temperature, so 1,000 over T. Um, the experimental data are the um, symbols here. So you can see a large number of data sources for this reaction, OH plus HO2. Um, so, you know, don't forget we're going back quite a few years here. So there may be more recent data. But, um, and actually, there's quite a lot of scatter in this data. Um, and so it was the job of the expert panel to kind of um, to fit um, where, where necessary, either an Arrhenius or a Trove fall-off um, parameterization to this, and then to, to give... Um, an uncertainty in the rate constant. And actually, unsurprisingly, f because of the level of scatter here, the maximum uncertainty factor is quite large. Um, given another example here, HO2 plus HO2. Um, here, the, the, the data is sat more tightly around a fit, but um, there are some scattered values here. Um, so again, the uncertainty is reasonably large with an uncertainty factor of, of 2.5. And actually, for both these cases, which, which I think is useful, there's an uncertainty in the pre-exponential factor. Oh, sorry, no, there's an uncertainty given at two temperatures, which would allow you to, to have some uncertainty information about the temperature dependence of the rate constant, which is useful. But, you know, I mean, as, as the field's expanded and there are a lot, <laughs> a lot more measurements happening, um, I guess funding for this effort, uh, this human effort of gathering of experts, probably died away. And... Um, so these panels no longer meet. So we, we, we don't really now have a way of um, easily bringing together all these data sources and, and getting an estimate of our uncertainties. Um, the NIST database is one place where data is gathered together. It's not always up to date, but um, at least in the NIST database, you can compare data from different sources and you can, you, um, you can uh, fit uh, lines of best fit or... Um, NIST will give you estimated uh, Renius parameterizations, etc., and, and, and will allow you to um, select certain data sets and calculate what the overall error might be. Um, I think I've put an example here. Yeah, so it's formaldehyde plus HO2. So again, you, you can select all the different data sources, and then um, you can fit either a, a simple Arrhenius expression or uh, an extended Arrhenius expression and it will uh, give you the root mean square error, um, which allows you to, to make some estimate of the uncertainty. So that is still quite a useful tool. Um, more and more, although not as commonly as you might like, we, um, theoretical studies are giving um, estimates of um, the uncertainty in the predictive values. So I have shown some examples of that earlier in the week. I mean, otherwise, if you're putting together a mechanism and you want to propagate uncertainties, Sometimes you have to trawl the literature for individual papers and, and just put the information together yourself. And I say I find it is a tedious job. And, um, you know, so people who, who are constructing mechanisms, I mean, 
I would like to see these features as well in, in, in um, generators like RMG. Um, give us uncertainties on the data that, uh, that are being produced with the mechanism because it would be really helpful. Uh, and I have been trying to get that message out for quite a long time and people say, yes, that's a great idea. And then the next time they produce a mechanism, don't really see it there. So um, because it, it takes a lot of effort and I'm, you know, I do understand the reason why um, we don't always see that data. So, uh, you know, sometimes it is a tough job to put um, input and certainty information together. Um, I will go on to say a bit more about this in detail. One, one of the efforts um, to actually, you know, really consistently, um, well, determine first and, and then provide us as users with uh, information on uncertainty data are the active um, thermochemical tables from Branko Rustic and collaborators um, based at Argon. And so I'll, I'll go into that in a bit more detail later about how the active um, tables networks actually work. And then um, I, I've talked a little bit about um, um, multiscale informatics earlier in the week, uh, where we were bringing together experimental data and theoretical data for specific um, reaction sequences. And the output of that was... Um, probability density information about the uncertainties, and so that's about as good as the, this information gets. Um, I'll talk more about optimization later, but um, Thomas Trani's group um, at Budapest have, have started looking at, um, you know, lots of different fuel systems, and as an output from their optimization work, they give us, you know, full uncertainty information, correlated uncertainty information for, for the parameters of the produced model. So that, again, is also useful. Um, but more often than not, you know, we are left with trying to estimate uncertainties. Um, and, you know, maybe um, some of those, um, well, some of the parameters that we, we're, we're estimating have come from things like rate rules um, and, um, you know, group additivity and things like that. And it, it would be good to develop uh, a consistent way of estimating parameterizations using those type of techniques. At the moment, we're mainly just using kind of rules of thumb of you know, a factor of two or a factor of five, depending on um, the level of training data that we've used to, um, to predict the rate constants. Um, there are different ways of representing uncertainty. Commonly, well, I'm not trying to think if there are any exceptions to this, but usually what we do is we represent the log of the rate constant uh, or the log of the A factor um, as, um, as a normal distribution. And um, we've got choices about how wide um, that distribution we want to accept within our uncertainty ranges. So this is basically just stand, um, following standard statistics, really. If, if we have... Um, a distribution in log of our rate constants which looks normal. Um, if we want to say our uncertainties are within 68% of um, the mean value, then we would take one sigma. Standard error two sigma would be 95%. Three sigma would include outlying values that have a very low probability um, based on the information we have. So 99.7% of data. So typically we would tend to um, use two sigma as our uncertainty um, limits. And so um, uh, K naught would be um, the nominal value, so the recommended value of the rate constant. And if we took two sigma, then um, K minimum would be two sigma below that, and the K max would be two sigma above. So we're kind of therefore neglecting these infrequent, unlikely values at the edges of the distribution. Um, so you, you saw in the Bolsch um, information that you're given an F value, so an uncertainty factor. Well, that is basically equal to um, log um, base 10 of uh, the nominal value over the, the minimum value, which is the same in the symmetrical distribution as log base 10 of K max over, over K0. Or another way of thinking about that is K max over K0 was equal to 10 to the F. Okay, so let's just look at some examples there. Um, so 
I'm trying to think what, what the values were on the plot we just looked at. Um, I think they were between sort of two and five. If the uncertainty parameter is about 0.1 and we take um, two sigma as our limits and that gives an uncertainty of 17%. If we get up to 0.5, then it's more than a factor of two. If it's as large as one, then we're up to an uncertainty of a factor of seven. It's just, uh, we will need this as we go forward. Um, the statistical kind of optimization methods, so the methods that are used in multiscale informatics or in optimization approaches, the output from that is actually a joint probability distribution. And so um, here, um, then, um, we've got information on correlations between parameters. And what we'll see later on is that actually when we apply optimization techniques uh, to fit our, parameter, our model parameters, we very often find correlations between them. Um, and we have to be a little bit careful about this because um, if we do have strong correlations between parameters, um, what this means is we have to sample from that probabilistic distribution if we're trying to estimate the overall output uncertainty. So in this particular case, um, it's a kind of normalization of the A factor um, and the activation energy here. So for a particular um, activation energy, say, not all values of the A factor are feasible from that joint PDF. I mean, overall, it, you know, the, the, the um, uh, pre-exponential factor can take on a wide range of values, but that's very dependent on um, the activation energy within that distribution. And, it, and if, you, if, you, if you assume the distribution filled the whole space and you propagated that through your model, you would be over um, predicting the uncertainties. So um, correlations are important to take account of when we're propagating uncertainties. So, I mean, if we've got nice information, we, uh, probabilistic information, then you know, we can assume something like a log normal distribution and we might have the full joint PDF. I mean, in most of the things that we've looked at, this is what our distribution looks like. It's like we don't really know what the overall probabilities are. We sort of have a feel for what the minimum and the maximum value are, and so we're just going to assume an even distribution, a uniform distribution across that range. Um, so, you know, we might say a factor of two or a factor of five. Um, so, I, you know, if anyone's involved in this kind of work for the, or you get involved in it in the future, it would be really useful to have estimates based on reaction classes from, you know, the types of software that we might be using to generate our models. Um, what is the overall uncertainty for a particular reaction class and how might that uncertainty change as the number of carbons grows, for example, um, so that we get an automatic um, provision of uncertainty information when we generate a mechanism. Um, so I would say that active tables are probably about the most sophisticated application of um, Minimize, well, for minimizing uncertainties within um, parameter networks that we, that we find in a combustion area. Um, so all of this information is freely available from the active tables. You can go to uh, the website based at Argon. Um, so what, um, what the active tables are doing is trying to estimate um, as constrained as possible a set of thermodynamic data for as many species as they can include. So as usual, um, the information is very good for small species um, and starts to die away as we get to larger uh, fuel type species. Um, so what it does is it sets up a, um, a network, a thermochemical network, by which we mean that all species that might be connected um, through reactions in with respect to any of the data sets are actually connected through the network. And so when we, when we have a set of connected species and we have a new data set, which might be theory or it might be experiment, to, to help us constrain, that's going to constrain all of the sensitive species in that network. Okay, so the more um, connected a species, I mean, obviously the smaller species are connected very, very widely. And so there's far more information to, to be able to constrain the values for those than there is for the larger species. So it's bringing together both experimental and high-level theoretical studies. Um, 
And um, what it's providing then uh, at the end of all of this is, um, well, heats of formation uh, at zero and 298, which are useful to us, um, along with um, the uncertainty in those values. Um, and actually also they do um, produce um, information in the form of NASA polynomials, which goes into the Burkat type databases that we re will read into Kenkin or Cantera or whatever. Um, okay, so a few examples here. I mean, even something like heptane, um, there's quite a lot of information informing the, the network about heptane. And so um, the uncertainty in the heat formation for heptane is below a kilojoule per mole. So it's quite highly constrained. But then when we go to um, more complex fuels, um, you know, these values can grow 1.5 kilojoules per mole, et cetera. So um, if you're using information from a Burkat database, um, some of it will come from the active tables. And then you'll find the uncertainties are quite small compared to um, values that have been estimated using um, um, methods in firm, so based on group additivity. So this is, I won't dwell on this too long, but this is just basically an example of part of um, the thermochemical network. Okay, so it's very complicated. If you, you, a new piece of data becomes available on, on any... Uh, reaction in this network or in the wider network, um, it involves re-optimizing the whole network, right? I mean, you would hope for um, small species, so hydrogen and C1, that new sets of information wouldn't lead to very big changes because, you know, there's already um, a, a very high level of constraint on those values. So actually, one of the points I want to make in the last slide... I say this on behalf of Branko Rusic because I think he's very concerned about this, is that you know, the, the output from this network is a joint probability uh, distribution. These are highly correlated parameters. And um, well, we're not very good at propagating uncertainties in thermodynamic data anyway. Um, even when we do, even though I know that these are correlated, if I was going to propagate these, I wouldn't use a joint PDF because we don't have that for everything in our model. So, we, you know, <laughs> well, um, nobody's doing this, I don't think, is actually propagating these uncertainties from the correlated distribution. But strictly speaking, that is what we, sh we should be doing because all of these species um, are connected, or most of them anyway. Um, yeah, I just put that in as an example of the um, equations that are being solved to optimise the network parameters. Um, Okay, so um, just a couple of examples. So if we take the CH3 radical, um, this is, of course, very, very connected through the network, um, and so will be uh, subject to a large um, volume of data. And as a result, the uncertainty in its heat of formation is extremely small, the 0 0.08 kilojoules per mole at 95% 90, confidence, so two sigma. Um, and actually, what the network does is it traces back and, 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 and can actually give information on the data sets that, that contribute to the constraint of that parameter. So um, the network tells you that there's 20 different data sets that account for 72.5% um, of the provenance on that. If we want to account for 90% of the provenance, then that's nearly 100 different data sets that have contributed. Okay, so obviously, the more high-quality data sets um, that are, are, are coupled to a species through the network, then the lower the uncertainty is going to be. Okay, so um, all this data is freely available, um, so you can, you can find it there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, another, another source of uh, data based on the uh, active thermochemical tables that you might find useful. Um, a fairly recent paper by the Argonne Group, led by um, Klippenstein, um, actually d carried out high-level ab initio electronic structure calculations for um, all species, including carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, in combustion, with 34 or fewer electrons. So again, just the smaller ones. Um, and what they were doing was 
was actually looking, compa comparing then their a priori um, predictions with um, the values that were achieved from the active thermochemical tables to try and work out what corrections in the theory um, were um, giving them the best improvements in, in their predictions. And um, basically, the, the um, broadest level of corrections are coming from uh, corrections due to excitations at the triplet um, and uh, quadruplet levels. So, but the most important thing probably about this paper for you guys is that actually they looked at an awful lot of species and so all that data is available. Um, well, this should look familiar. All, have you all opened the Burkat database? Yeah. But I don't know whether, you know, I mean, sometimes more mechanisms are propagated or they're in, you know, supplementary information in a paper in the literature. They're not always actually annotated. But you can always go back to the original Burkat file and look for the notes for the species of interest if you do need information. Um, so let's just look at um, examples, two examples here. For the first is formaldehyde. And um, you know, it's a small species, so we, we expect it to be in the thermochemical tables to start with, and we expect it to be highly connected and, and fairly well constrained. And so um, it will tell you the reference, so ATCT is your active thermochemical table. Um, and um, here, the uncertainty is um, 0.1 kilojoules, so that's pretty small. Um, for M-butanol, which is why we were looking at this, um, no, I'm afraid it doesn't come from the active thermochemical table. It's not in there. It comes from a paper from 1986. So it's not, it's not particularly recent um, data set. And um, the uncertainty is uh, 8 kilojoules, so it's pretty big. To KCAL. Um, so there's, you know, there really is a massive difference in the um, um, accuracy of thermochemical data depending on whether or not they're in the um, thermochemical network or not. So has anyone come across the, um, the ACTC before? I think if you, if you are working on model improvements, it's worth a look. Okay, so um, I want to move on now to um, talk about propagating uncertainties and how we interpret them. So first of all, um, what's the difference between uncertainty analysis and sensitivity analysis? Um, so uncertainty quantification is taking um, the uncertainties in our input parameters to the model and propagating them through to our predictions and trying to put error bars on our predictions. Um, so this is um, some predictions of ignition delay time. Oh, I don't know, it's just a random example. Um, plotted against a percentage CO in a, in a wet CO mixture. Um, so the experimental data is as we might expect. It's, it's um, some values of ignition delay measurements with some error bars on them, which get bigger as the delay time gets longer. We're used to seeing that. But usually, we would just plot a single line for our model. Um, but actually, what we're saying now is, is if we want to understand the level of agreement between the model and the experiments, we really do need um, error bars on our model. So here, we're propagating the uncertainties and maybe using one or two sigma to um, express these error bars. OK, so in this case, it's telling us that there is overlap between the model um, and the experiment but within really quite large uncertainties that the model contains. Um, sensitivity analysis, well, if, it, if it's done correctly, um, then what it, what it should tell us is how much each input parameter contributes to the extent of that error bar. Um, it's not how we normally use sensitivity analysis, so I'll talk about the different um, approaches here. Uh, that we do use in combustion in a minute. But ideally, to get the most useful information, we say, OK, there's a certain level of variance, for example, um, in, our, in our model outputs. Um, by how much does each input parameter uncertainty contribute to that output variance? And obviously, what we're looking to do is say, right, well, OK, this is the main parameter uh, that contributes to the output variance, so let's go away and try and find some more detailed information on that parameter to improve our knowledge about it. 
Um, and then I've just given an example from this particular study. Um, in this particular case, it was um, CO plus HO2, which was um, the main contributor to these large error bars. So let's think a bit about sensitivity analysis then. Um, I mean, there's different purposes to doing sensitivity analysis. So, you know, I mean, we all use the simplest version because it's computationally much easier to do. Um, and the simplest version is a, is a local sensitivity coefficient. So for this particular case, I've just got three parameters. So, I, so mainly because we can visualize that on the board. Um, and um, they have uncertainty ranges um, as expressed by this um, cube here. Um, but in local sensitivity analysis, what we do is we pick a, we pick a nominal point um, and then we just look at a local gradient around that point. Okay, so um, a local first order sensitivity, sensitivity coefficient, if our output is yi, is just uh, the partial derivative of the output with respect to the value of the input parameter at that point. Um, and that's what uh, we, we get free and pretty much in Chemkin, right? Um, y might be temperature or it might be OH concentration, for example. Um, so it's, it's, it is giving us some information. It's telling us, um, you know, for, for the most part, these values are going to be quite small um, if, in a large mechanism. So if, if the sensitivity coefficient is small, it's saying, well, I don't need to know this parameter very accurately to predict that output. And if, uh, if a sensitivity value is high, it's saying, okay, you know, if, I, if a small error in that parameter is going to lead quite, to quite a large error in my output. So we're all, you know, we all used to seeing those nice normalized sensitivity bars. Um, so we do normally uh, use normalized values so that we can compare um, um, parameters with different orders of magnitude. Okay, so we're just normalizing by the output value and the, and the parameter value. And these have been nicely coded into Chemkin. I put Cantera, but I'm not sure that whether or not they are in Cantera. Uh, but in Chemkin, um, you know, we can, we can look at um, sensitivity of OH. Peak OH is something that we often use as an output target, right? Um, okay, but the problem with this, there's two problems with this. One, it's not actually telling us what we want to know, which is, you know, which of these parameters are contributing to the output variance? Because some parameters will have very high sensitivities, H plus O2 is one example, but actually its uncertainty is really quite small. It's quite well constrained. So it, it isn't necessarily the main driver of errors in our model or uncertainties in our model. Um, so really what we need, the first thing we need to do is think about combining information on sensitivity with input uncertainty. And the, and the second thing is, um, uh, if, the uncertain, if these ranges are quite wide, so we've got a quite wide range between the minima and maxima, then just looking at a single point, we, we might be missing all sorts, right? And we certainly won't be looking um, at interactions that might happen between the parameters in our model. Okay, so, um, but, you know, we, it doesn't cost us very much to do this computationally. It's just one extra equation that we need to solve, and Cantera um, has coded that using efficient finite differences. Um, so even if, we, even if we calculate these local sensitivities, we can still extend this information um, to give us a, a crude estimate of um, the fractional contribution of each parameter to the output uncertainty. Um, and so we can do that by basically just multiplying um, sensitivity coefficient by the input uncertainty for each parameter um, and then a summing over all the parameters. So again, it's a crude estimate because it's based on that uh, single nominal value. Um, I mean, another thing that's useful to do, I suppose, is if you, if you do feel you've got a wide range for your parameter, is to actually carry out local analysis at more than one value, not just the recommended value, but maybe the recommended value multiplied by two or divided by two to see if the sensitivity changes over that range. And that will be much cheaper than the global methods I'm going to mention in a minute. So um, I guess the question is, should we be using local or global methods? I mean, like all these things, sometimes it depends on what you can afford. Um, okay, so um, 
Our local method then is just basically uh, looking at um, a small variability around uh, a, a recommended or a chosen value for our parameter, and it's giving us a single predicted output. Um, we could um, vary our parameters across the ranges um, and, and get a distribution of outputs. So that would give us an error bar on our predicted output. Or if we go even further and we have a probabilistic information about our input parameters, then we can propagate that through some kind of random sampling um, method. So sampling from within this distribution and predicting um, our model output for each member of that sample. And then what we'll get is an, uh, um, an output distribution. Okay, so there's three different levels of complexity. The first one is just a local sensitivity. We can, we can um, combine that with information about how wide our input uncertainties are and get some information on the output uncertainty, uh, output uncertainty width. Or we can s sample from our input uncertainty distribution and get probabilistic information about our output uncertainties. Any questions about that? Okay, so um, there's been, I guess, more concerted effort then to, um, uh, to come up with me methods for um, global uncertainty propagation uh, that will actually explore the whole of the um, input um, parameter space. So in this particular example here, I'm just assuming that... Um, you know, all values within that cube have an equal likelihood. Uh, we might also want to do probabilistic sampling to take account of covariances that we see in this type of information. It really depends on the quality of information that we've got to use. Okay, so if we, if we sample uh, from all um, areas of this um, uh, uncertainty cube, then we're going to predict an output distribution. So the obvious downside of this is, previously we were, we, we were um, using a quite a cheap method, uh, just a local gradient method around this point, and now we have to sample all around this space, um, and we have to run our model for each of these sample points. So that starts to get more expensive. And okay, I mean, I'm just, you know, this is just a three-dimensional cube, but you might be working with models that have thousands of reactions, so then you've got thousands of dimensional hyperspace to deal with. Um, so, I mean, all is not lost, in fact. Um, so the, the, the question is then, if we do have uh, a large number of parameters, how can we sample effectively to get, uh, you know, a robust estimates of these output distributions? So why use global methods? Um, well, people have asked me that. <laughs> it's like, why, why do you bother doing that? Um, because it is quite expensive to do. It involves, you know, um, large numbers of samples of our, of our model. And, um, you know, we don't necessarily always need that level of detailed information. Um, but there are, um, there are reasons why we do it. Um, so I've just shown here um, one example of um, a quasi-random sample. Um, I can't remember what the model was, to be honest. I think it might have been something like a... Uh, a flame model with nitrogen and sulfur chemistry, but let's, let's just assume it's that for now. Um, so we're sampling um, across the input uncertainty parameter space and then predicting the NO concentration as a mole fraction across that sample. Okay, so we might, let's just say for the sake of argument, we had 20 parameters that we were varying. Okay, so um, we're sampling from a 20-dimensional space and predicting the NO concentration. Okay, so I've just picked one parameter here to um, give this Monte Carlo type plot. So this is the A factor for one of the reactions. Um, and then, of course, because there are influences of more than one parameter, this um, predicted output concentration looks quite scattered. So if this was the only important parameter in our model, there would be no scatter in that plot because there would be no influence of uncertainties in any of the other parameters. It's very rare that that happens um, in, in a, um, a bulk model. 
Um, so there, there is an influence of other parameters. And so we look at that, uh, we look at the scatter plot here and go, well, I don't know. How can I see what the influence of this specific parameter is here? So I'll talk a bit later on about how we pull out um, parameter-specific information. Um, but let's just say we've done that, and this is um, the response of the NO concentration to this A factor, this line here. So um, the point I'm trying to make is, is that if, you're, if the nominal value of your parameter was, was given as this, and you only did a local sensitivity analysis at that point, um, you would see no sensitivity because the, the, the curve is flat. So you'd say, oh, this parameter's not important. Um, and um, so I won't, I'll leave it. I won't bother to look into it more. But you can see that this actually is nonlinear. This response is nonlinear. So if this was your nominal parameter here, then you see quite a steep gradient. So a change, a small change in A factor does give you a change in the predicted NO concentration. So um, in actual fact, this is the nominal value parameter here just on the um, turning point of the curve. So the point is that the sensitivity is not the same across the whole range. It's not linear. And um, therefore, um, in, in quite a lot of cases, if we don't look across the range, we might miss or overestimate sensitivities. Does that make sense? <laughs> Any questions? OK, so just to reiterate then, in this region of the parameter space, at high values of the A factor, there's a low sensitivity. Um, at low values of the A factor, there's a high sensitivity. Actually, physically, just to complicate things further, th there is a reason for this. I mean, if, if, um, if a reaction rate um, um, is really, really fast, sometimes there is a low sensitivity because it's just... It's only important that it's, it's forming products. It doesn't matter how fast it's forming them. It's just fast. And as the reaction rate um, get, gets slower, it might become more rate determining. And so therefore, the, the sensitivity to it is likely to be higher. So there are, there are physical reasons why we would expect to see uh, these nonlinearities. Just check the time. So um, there, are, there are advantages of these global me methods. They do give us more reliable estimates of our overall uncertainty, um, and they give us more information. Um, we'll see later on that they can give us detailed information on the contribution to predictive variance. But um, the problem is that they're sampling-based methods, and so we need to do a large number of model runs um, to make them work or to make them reliable. Um, we also need... De fairly decent knowledge of the, of the input parameter distributions. Um, and then we also need to be able to um, interpret that scattered data from the Monte Carlo type um, simulations to pull out our sensitivity indices. And so these uh, w are the sort of class of global sensitivity methods. Um, the way in which we normally apply uh, these methods is to apply some sort of screening first, um, thus possibly breaking the rules I've just stated. So we, we might do a local sensitivity analysis, and we might do it at not just the nominal value, but you know, at the nominal value and at the edges of the uncertainty range that we think we have. And, and, and if there's no um, local sensitivity at any of those points, we'll say, OK, um, the system's not that sensitive to that parameter. So we'll just keep it at the, at the recommended value and we won't take it forward to the global analysis. And those parameters that rank highly in the local method, we will then include in our global sensitivity analysis. And we might include 30, 40, 50 of those, and that, that's quite easy to do. I probably wouldn't include 20,000. But then, you know, it would be so unlikely to have a model that was sensitive. It just isn't going to be sensitive to 20 or 20,000 reactions. There are always more reactions that are insensitive than that are sensitive. Um, so I, I think the typical screening technique that we normally use is just to do a local sensitivity analysis at the recommended value, maybe twice the recommended value and half the recommended value. Or, you know, you could choose it at the edges of your uncertainty range, whatever's most suitable. Um, 
And we can calculate these automatically in ChemKim, for example, for you know, peak OH or for peak temperature. And that's pretty straightforward to do. Um, if we were looking at something like ignition delay time, that's a bit more tricky because that's kind of an integrated output, really. Um, so ChemKin can't handle that in a simple way. Um, you might end up having to use something like a brute force method where you just write a script that runs through each parameter and changes it by a few percent and um, analyzes the change in output. But if we have got 10,000 parameters, that, that is really expensive um, to do anyway. Um, yeah, I think I'll skip the Morris method. I'm not sure you need to know about that. Um, so this is an example of a, a, a screening method that we actually applied to thermodynamic data. Uh, so in this particular case, we were looking at um, the uncertainty um, in heats of, for, of formation for various species in a propane oxidation model, trying to model some microgravity experiments. Um, and actually looking at the, the time to the cool flame in this case, so um, the low temperature heat release um, in an ignition event. Um, hopefully you won't be surprised now to see these species here, which are our RO2 and QOH species on the low temperature chemistry routes I've been coming back to all week. Um, so what this is saying is that um, in terms of heats of formation, um, the, the, there are key... Um, fuel-related species in that low-temperature oxidation cycle um, that have key heats of formation. Um, anyone want to suggest why um, heats of formation would be important in that cycle? What, what do they affect? Sorry? Equilibrium, is that what you said? Uh, not necessarily, no. Well, they're going to affect the equilibrium between... So, for example, I talked about the um, uh, um, isomerization from RO2 to, Q, uh, to QOH. And um, the equilibrium between that, the, the reverse reaction rate will be strongly affected by the thermodynamic parameters. So, um, so the uh, thermodynamic uh, parameters are, are strongly going to affect... Um, whether we go forwards down the um, low temperature branching chain or, or not, or whether we go back to the alkyl radical. Okay, so, um, just one example um, of a, a screening study. Okay, so once we've screened then, um, uh, we've, we've kind of knocked out all the parameters we think are not particularly sensitive, then we might want to um, go on to do a full sampling of, of the remaining ones. And actually, um, typically for random sampling, people use a random number generator and use a Monte Carlo approach. Uh, we don't do that, actually, because um, actually it just doesn't converge very well at all. And the, one of the reasons is this is just a two-dimensional sample. Um, and even in two dimensions, using um, typical random sampling methods, we get holes in some parts of the space and we get clusters in other parts of the space. So, that, you know, here we've got missing information and here we've got three samples which are going to give us very similar information. So it's kind of a waste of effort. Um, we need those points to be sort of in here somewhere. Um, and actually, um, this is looking at just 100 um, sample points for two parameters. This really should be flat, but it isn't. Um, so what does that say? Well, we've got a light colour. So, yeah, that's just pointing out that we've got clusters and holes. Um, so, we tend to recommend using structured sampling approaches. So, you, you, you've got um, a nice filling out of your space. And um, going back to the Monte Carlo holes, I mean, if, we, you know, if we've got a 40-dimensional space, uh, that issue about holes and clusters is going to get more extreme, particularly for small sample sizes. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is get as good as information as is possible using the very smaller sample size because each sample is a, another run of the model. Um, so um, some people recommend using Latin hypercube sampling. Uh, in Latin hypercube, we would split, so this is again just two parameters, 
So we split this into a grid of a certain resolution. So I think there's 10 by 10 grid points here. And then we randomly sample a point from, from each row um, and each column of this grid. Okay, so if you look down here, there will be one sample um, in each of the columns and one sample in each of the rows. And so we get nice coverage of the space. But, um, I mean, you can go away and do the maths, but this quickly becomes quite expensive as we get to high dimensional spaces. So it might be a recommended method if you're looking at five to 10 parameters. But if you want to look at 50 or 60 parameters, this is going to get quite costly in terms of the number of runs you need to do. Um, and so the method we use is actually called the low discrepancy sequence. Um, so uh, Sobol um, is, uh, I guess he's a Russian scientist who's done a lot of work on uncertainty propagation. And um, so you see his name cropping up, but actually uh, recommended this um, method for um, filling out space in, as, in an effective as way as possible. So um, in this um, type of low discrepancy sequence, we're adding sample points in positions as far away as we can from the ones we've got. So we're trying to maximize space coverage. Okay, so this is just an example. So the, the Sobol sequence is, is based uh, on a, um, a base two sample size. Okay, so have I got animation here? Yeah, so if you take the, the red here, if you can only afford two samples, um, then this is where the points would be. So this is two, two samples of three numbers parameters. If we can afford four, um, then it's placing the two that it's adding as far away as possible from the two it's already got. Um, if we can afford eight, then this is what the sample will look like, 16, etc. Um, actually, normally, um, this will be a random number, not zeros. So you start with a random number, and then you're adding um, samples um, in powers of two. So um, the design of these low discrepancy sequences is to basically try to give um, the best rate of convergence that we can um, for our predicted output um, information. And so that's going to save us um, computational cost. Okay, so um, this is a, um, some work that I've taken from a, a telozine species from quite a while back. But... We just tested the different strategies on um, just a, a, a very simple model. So we've got two input parameters, x1 and x2, and our output is just a nonlinear function of um, x2 and a linear function of x1. And then um, for various different sampling strategies, um, we're plotting um, the mean and the variance of our output as a function of sample size. So... Um, in terms of the mean, you can see that the, um, the random sequence, the, the standard Monte Carlo, uh, it's only just start really converging at about 800 sample points. Um, and, and the same for the Latin hypercube. Um, but the Sobol sequence, which is the low discrepancy, has um, converged after only a couple of hundred samples. And even when we look at variance, so here the random sequence hasn't really converged after 1,000 samples. Um, but um, the Sobol sequence has converged before we get to about 200. Okay, so that's a massive saving in terms of the number of model runs that we have to carry out to calculate our um, output mean and variance. Um, so this is just an example from a study we did of a, a butane oxidation system. So just to show you really the difference between what these samples look like, so on the left, we've just got a normal pseudo-random um, number generator, so sampling using that. And again, you can see these uh, sort of holes and clusters in the sample. And this is um, the low discrepancy Sobol sequence. In the second plot here, um, we've actually... Um, we're sampling from a, a, a probabilistic distribution. Um, and again, you can see um, a much nicer behaviour of the low discrepancy sample compared to just the normal random sample. So um, kind of after doing all this work, we, we, we always use Sobel sequences now for the uh, propagation of uncertainties. Oops. Yeah. Um, so what parameters should we include? We pretty much always fall short. <laughs> 
in, in, one, in one of these uh, areas. So ideally, all the Arrhenius parameters, not just the A factors, uh, but that's unusual, if I'm honest. Um, ideally, thermodynamic parameters as well, um, because they're used to calculate reverse reaction rates. Uh, so few studies of, of uncertainties due to thermodynamic parameters in the literature. Um, ideally, we in, if we're modeling flames, we should include uncertainties in transport data. I'm not sure I could count even on two hands that, those type of studies. And then we've got other potential model errors, so temperature profile of our reactor maybe, heat transfer coefficients, residence times in a JSR, uh, and maybe even loss of uh, radicals to the wall, for example. So um, there is a long list, and you know we, I'm quite keen on this topic, but I'm guilty of ignoring some of these quite often, because um, basically it's hard, it's hard to gather uncertainty data for a lot of these um, for complicated fuels. Um, so I guess the most common approach is really just to look at the A factors. Um, and that will tell us something about the important reactions, which quite often is really what we're trying to establish. So I, I'm not going to say it's wrong. Um, it's just to do a full uncertainty analysis, we should include all of this. I mean, if, if what we're trying to do is say, well, I'm just trying to identify the key reactions that I need to improve my data for, then doing an analysis of just the A factors will give you most of that information. Still very useful. Um, I'll just go through this before the break. So, um, so from that butane model that just showed you the sample distributions, this is what um, an output might look like if we use um, uh, a low discrepancy SOBOL sample. And this is basically um, the predicted ignition delay for the experiments and it's giving you the frequency of uh, predictions of an ignition delay of a given time. Okay, so the most frequently predicted ignition delay time is, is 0.05 seconds in this case. Um, and the, the distribution is fairly tight. So the tighter the distribution, then the better we're predicting the output. Um, but we've got this long tail. Okay, so that's saying, well... Um, there's not very many cases, but there are some cases where the model is predicting an ignition delay time of five times the most frequent one. So it's kind of statistically a kind of the outliers. Um, so, um, well, I'll come back to this later, but that's, this, these kind of tails normally suggest we've got some interactions between parameters that are influencing the output prediction. Um, so, you know, at low temperatures, we've got a fairly narrow distribution, but with this long tail. Um, at 900K, the tail has gone. Um, the output distribution is wider. Um, and if we, you know, the two sigma um, estimate is about a factor of two uncertainty in the prediction. Okay, so um, based on what we knew about the input uncertainties, we're saying we can predict the output ignition delay by a factor of two, which is would look all right in the log scale, I suppose. <laughs> um, and then um, as we go to higher temperatures, um, then the, the distribution narrows again. Okay, so we, um, it should make sense why this is the case, because I, I've said before that at higher temperatures, the, the chemistry is usually driven by the small molecule chemistry at, at these higher temperatures. And, and these, the small molecule chemistry in models is better constrained than the fuel-specific chemistry. So we would expect a higher fidelity prediction at high temperatures than we would, for example, in the NTC region. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just... Just um, go through this couple of slides and we'll adjust the break as accordingly. So um, what we can do then, if we, if we um, plot this, so we, so we do our, make our predictions across a broad range of temperatures, is that instead of just giving a single line now of our predicted uh, log ignition delay against 1,000 over T, we've actually got um, 
a sort of shaded area which is giving us, um, let me just check what I've plotted here, either one or uh, one sigma of, of those output distributions. Um, and so that's a more realistic way to represent the model data. And it's a better way of comparing the, um, the model data with the experimental values. Um, and what we can see is that, as I suggested on the last slide, at high temperatures, um, the shaded region is quite narrow. And we get good agreement with the experiments. And so we've got a fairly robust prediction, which is in good agreement with the measurements. But as we move into the NTC region, um, then the uncertainty of the predictions is much wider. Um, but we still overlap with the experimental values. Um, and in the same study, we also looked at predicted uncertainties, speciation from a jet stove reactor. And um, for the most part here, we've got fairly narrow predictions, actually, of, um, of um, the predicted um, mole fractions. And we get quite a good representation of the butane, um, including the, the NTC region here, where the reactivity lowers. But we've got some problems with formaldehyde, where there's only just an overlap between our uncertainties and the uh, um, uh, measurement uncertainties at low temperatures. And then for ethene, we've got a big gap between um, the measurement uncertainties and the model. So we've got about a factor of two over prediction here, uh, even at the higher temperatures. And, and that, is with, that is taking into account um, the uncertainties in our model. So there's, there's two possible reasons for that. One is we were, we were wrong about the input uncertainties, and they're actually bigger than we thought. Or the second reason is we've got some missing model pathway, missing pathways in our model. So we've got some structural problems with the model, because even if we account for uncertainties, we can't reproduce the data. But actually, that's, even that is a useful piece of information. Maybe, maybe we need to think about what pathways we might have missing. I don't think, well, I don't know. Maybe if you just plotted a line, you, 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 you would draw that conclusion. I'm not sure. But I think it, you can draw that conclusion more robustly if you've actually um, plotted the probable distribution of the outputs. OK, so that's a good place to take a break. So <laughs> I think, I'm not sure anyone's got the stomach for this slide, so I think I'm just going to describe this in very simple words rather than go through the complex statistics at this stage of the week. Um, so um, well, what, would, what I want to um, just tackle briefly next is how we've now got this sampling-based method and we've uh, propagated the uncertainties um, to our predicted outputs. How do we pull out sensitivity information from that? And what, what we're trying to calculate, usually, we use a variance-based method. So we're trying to say how much of the output variance can be attributed to the uncertainty in each of our input parameters. Okay, so um, how much does each parameter lead to uh, potential uncertainties or errors in our prediction? And yeah, so the original um, method, this variance-based method, came from Sobol. Um, I'm not going to go through the maths because it's getting too late, really. But the, the problem with Sobol's original method was it required a huge sampling size because what it, what it was doing was um, constraining parameters one by one and then for each constrained parameter, running a random sample for all the other parameters and then constraining the second parameter and running a random sample for all the other parameters. Um, and so uh, the problem with... Um, you know, the original Sobel method was it scaled as um, the sample size um, times the number, two times the number of um, parameters plus one. Okay, so um, this is, you know, if we had 50 uncertain parameters, the number of model runs would just be prohibitively large. So the concept of this variance-based sensitivity analysis is a good one, um, but using... Um, the fundamental methods is, is too expensive for us. Um, and in so what we do is we use um, response surface methods uh, as a way of uh, reducing the computational cost. So what we're trying to do here is we're still a sampling-based method, sampling from our input distributions, 
predicting a range of output distributions. But then what we're going to do is fit a model to represent that relationship. So we can call it a meta model or call it a response surface or whatever you like. But it's a, a, a simpler model um, that's cheaper to run than the full model that will give us the whole of the response of our predicted outputs as a function of the input parameters. Um, so again, we need to take a su suitable sampling approach. Um, and then we've got to find some kind of um, um, model form um, to represent that response surface. Um, nor, I would say that most of these methods, if not all of them, are all based on orthonormal polynomial type expansions uh, to differing uh, degrees of accuracy. Um, and um, they usually work fairly well. So I don't know if any of you have come across uh, polynomial chaos expansions, yeah. So I think that some of these methods are probably embedded in ChemChem now, are they? Yeah. Um, so um, the polynomial chaos expansion method is just a response surface method uh, that's mapping uh, our, uncertain, our uncertain parameters um, to output predictions um, as a polynomial function. So um, if we take the example of rate coefficients, first of all, they're normalized into factorial variables, x, um, as a function of uh, the nominal value and an uncertainty factor, which is uh, 10 to the f. Um, and then we're going to uh, scale these then as a result of this between um, minus 1 and plus 1, where um, 0 is the nominal value of the rate coefficient in the middle of that range. And then we're, we're trying to calculate a response surface of the, the predicted combustion properties or targets um, with respect to x. So, I mean, the details aren't that important. Uh, basically, um, this approach is expressing the uncertainty as a polynomial expansion of basis random variables. Um, and um, skip past the details. Basically, we're going to um, use second order polynomials to represent that expansion. So what we end up with um, is an equation um, which shows the overall model prediction is given by its nominal value plus uncertainty contributions from each rate coefficient. Okay, so um, we're basically, in simple terms, setting up a response surface um, using second order polynomials. And, and we can directly, based on the form of the equations, then pull out um, the variance contributions from each of the input parameters. So um, this has been used in a, a large number of applications. And um, one of the advantages of the approach is that once you've got that response surface, you can actually all also use that within an optimization approach. Uh, so in this example here from Sheen et al. in 2009, um, this is basically simulations of flame speed for an ethylene air flame mixture at one atmosphere. Um, the um, symbols will be the experiments. And then the, um, the light gray shaded region is the prior model. So the model um, and uh, its predicted uncertainties without any optimization of the rate constants. Okay, so it's giving you a fairly wide distribution of flame speeds based on, um, uh, I guess, the uh, um, estimated or, or, or um, derived uncertainties in the input parameters. And then the, 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 the response surface is used to optimize that against a set of experimental targets. And of course, the optimized model is better constrained. And so now um, the uncertainties in the inputs um, will have been tightened. Uh, and so the output distribution is much narrower. Okay, so this is kind of a demonstration of the technique. Um, I would suggest that basically, in, in, unless um, you're isolating a small number of parameters, optimizing against very reduced data sets um, is probably not the way we should be going. Um, so I think what we'll order which to say this really. But um, so l earlier in the week, I was talking about kinetics experiments where we're trying to isolate a single reaction um, and therefore you know, a single rate constant um, within our experiment, in which case then we can use the experimental data to you know, constrain that parameter. Um, otherwise, when, we, when we're looking at things like flame speeds, there's going to be sensitivity to lots of parameters in the model. 
Um, so optimization really in those circumstances should be based on as broad a set of data as we can find for that particular model system. That's what's used in the active thermochemical tables and, and that's what's used in um, modern um, optimization approaches. Um, a second way to do this, uh, which actually also falls out as uh, polynomial expansions, is um, using analysis of variance methods based on high-dimensional model representation methods. Again, it might be a bit late in the week for some of this. Um, so basically here what we're saying is, is that, um, and I think this comes from Sobel as well, that we can decompose the variance in our output um, as a function of... Um, the variance due to individual parameters acting independently, um, plus any interactive terms up to um, order of number of parameters. So the second term here is the variance due to interaction between two parameters, up three parameters, etc. And all of this should add up to the total variance in the model. The sensitivity coefficient then would be for for um, um, well, let's just take individual parameters at the moment. So that would be the variance that would be due to um, uncertainties in parameter xj divided by the total variance in, in, in the output. And so the sensitivity um, coefficient would be, a, would be a fraction of 1, and it would give us the fraction of the total variance that's due to the uncertainty in that parameter. So if, we've, if we're using uh, response surface methods and we've got a very good fit, um, then we should be able to calculate sensitivity coefficients for um, all of our parameters and interactions, and they should add up to close to one. And if they add up to close to one, then um, we've represented the majority of the output variance. So we're attributing um, the output variance to various different causes. Uh, it might be more obvious when I show some examples. So um, the high-dimensional model representation is, again, a surface response method it was actually developed by, um, um, well, originally Sobel, but, but, but in terms of um, applications to kinetics and combustion, by Hirsch Rabbits, who's studying chemistry here at, at Princeton, um, and Jenny Wan Lee, um, who was a senior research fellow in chemistry uh, as well. Um, and this is basically an expansion technique, um, but unlike the Taylor expansion, um, we can actually truncate this. Um, usually what we find in chemical systems is that if we include first order effects of parameters and second order interactions between two parameters, then we can describe almost all the variance in our model. It's, it's fairly unusual to find higher order um, interactions between parameters in chemical kinetic systems. Um, and that is quite useful because that the higher the order of interactions we see, the, the bigger the sample size we would need to get a good response surface to calculate the sensitivity coefficients. Um, so if you remember back, I, just before the break, I showed that distribution of ignition delay times with the long tail. Um, I said the long tail was due to second order um, uh, interactions in that model. Um, and actually, to pull those out, um, we probably need five to ten times the sample size that we would if we just have first order interactions. So, you know, sometimes we want to go to that effort and sometimes we don't, I suppose. Um, so, um, the, the HDMR uh, approach um, works by fitting a response surface as um, the sum of, incre uh, of, of um, functions of increasing order of interaction. Okay, so here... Um, F0 is a constant, which is just basically the expected value of the model output or the average model output. Um, Fi is giving you the first order component functions, which are um, giving the effect of, um, well, I put variables, but we, we kind of mean parameters really, acting independently um, on the output. So this is a nonlinear function, okay? So we can include nonlinearities here. Um, the response doesn't have to be linear. Okay, but this is, these are first order nonlinear functions. And then um, the, the term here is a second order term describing these interactive effects of the variables upon the output. Um, so what does that mean? That, that, the, the interactive effects are, uh, are saying um, 
Well, the effect of my particular parameter xi depends on the sampled value of the other parameter xj. Um, I mean, maybe you think that might be expected, but actually these higher order interactions are usually a quite a small part of the overall variance. Okay, so um, the details are really too long to include in a basic course like this, but basically what, we, what we're doing here is fitting an accurate meta model that represents that expansion, and then from that expansion we can very easily back out um, the variance-based sensitivity coefficients. And again, this is a polynomial-based method. Um, for actually, um, for the most part, um, the, the applications of this uh, go up to higher than, se than second-order polynomials. So uh, we've, we've actually got code available if anyone wants it, MATLAB-based code that goes up to 10th order um, polynomial expansion functions. So um, there's probably a bit more flexibility in this than in the polynomial chaos, but at second-order polynomials, they should be the same thing, really. Okay, so um, basically then we're, we're going to calculate the variance-based sensitivity indices uh, that map onto this equation, um, and um, we would hope that we've got a sample size big enough um, that the calculated indices are going to add up to close to one. Okay, um, is there anything new on this slide? So the way in which this works is we use a quasi-random sample. So I've said already that we're using low discrepancy SOBOL sequences. Um, and then um, we're fitting our HDMR uh, meta model um, using up to 10th order polynomials. And um, the, the sample size that we use will be uh, 2 to the n. Uh, so from experience, um, if the, out, uh, if the um, sensitivities are mainly first order in nature, we can quite often get away with a sample size of around 1,024. Um, if we've got significant um, cooperative interactions, uh, then we would have to go larger than that. I mean, the code that we've got available will actually calculate the um, accuracy of the meta-model fit, so at least you know whether you can rely on the coefficients that you've calculated. Um, okay, I think I've just said all that, haven't I? So, but just uh, the final point here is that, that to remember that this is a base two system. So um, the sample sizes are going to um, increase in the kind of expanding way as we go to larger and larger sizes. It's not to say you can't use a sample size in between, but you'll get a more balanced sample if you use um, one that's of uh, two to the n basis. So um, going back to the same example then of the uh, butane model, so I showed this plot before. This is the overall um, variance in our output. So now what we're trying to do is to attribute the causes of that variance uh, to sensitivity in the different parameters of the scheme and to use that to learn something about the chemistry, I suppose. Um, and um, just at the very um, uh, basic level, what we learn uh, well, what we confirm, I suppose, is that um, at the higher temperatures, the uncertainty in the predicted ignition delays comes from the C0 to C2 base scheme of the model. And um, in the NTC region, um, the uncertainties are primarily, primarily due to the primary fuel scheme in the model, and the uncertainties are larger, of course. And then we can decompose that variance into individual reactions. Okay, so this is, I did show some plots that looked a bit like this earlier in the week. So hopefully it make a bit more sense now. But um, so here are our first order sensitivities. Um, so what we, well, this white space here suggests that about 20% of the variance is due to higher order interactions. Um, well, I mean, we did calculate higher order. It just gets, it's too complicated to show them, basically. But so I think probably our fit got us to about 90 or more percent. So it, it, it's reasonable, but there, are, there may be some third order interactions that we, we haven't managed to fit. Um, so what does it tell us about the chemistry? Well, so now each of these will be our um, variance based sensitivity coefficient. So, um, you know, reaction 26 has. Um, nearly, uh, well, 30-something percent of the output variance is due to this reaction. So the, the larger the bar is here, the larger 
and the proportion of the uh, predicted variance comes from individual parameters. Okay, so um, at low temperatures, we might not be that surprised. This is the isomerization, again, of RO2 to QOH, um, and um, actually the direct elimination of HO2 crops up um, as well. Okay, so the question is, how does this relate to the linear sensitivity coefficients, the local linear coefficients that we normally use? I mean, quite often, the reactions that we find are the same, um, but the ordering, the ranking, will, will, will quite often be different. Um, because now we're taking into account the inherent uncertainty in the inputs, and not just um, you know, calculating a normalized local value. Um, as we get to intermediate temperatures, um, then, um, as I said, I suppose, a few times during the week, HO2 becomes more important, and it, it is part of why we get that NTC region. So abstraction of um, a hydrogen by HO2 crops up in this middle region. And this was the region where the, uh, the variance was the largest. And one of the reasons is, is because we don't have great data for fuel plus HO2 type reactions. It's hard to measure HO2. Um, and then as we go to higher temperatures, um, in local sensitivity analysis, we almost always see just small molecule chemistry but that, but that small molecule chemistry is quite well constrained. And so when you do a proper, well, I shouldn't use the word proper, when you do a full global um, variance-based decomposition, you do actually see some fuel-specific reactions ranking more highly. And actually, um, you don't often see those in local analysis. Okay, so um, in the high-temperature region, we've, we, we've got a mixture of, um, well, uh, typical chain branching routes, and actually um, abstraction by hydrogen from butane as well as OH. So, you know, it is giving us a lot more information than a local analysis. Um, is it worth a computational effort? I guess it's up to individual users to decide, really, whether that's the case. Oh, yes. It's to remind me, I think I've already said it, that basically the, these uh, tails that we see here are these higher order effects that I haven't put on this plot, but they, uh, they are there because they involve the interactive effects of uh, two parameters acting together. Um, just going back now to reiterate the importance of uncertainties in thermodynamic data. Um, so we tend to focus mainly, I think, on... Um, well, mainly even on A factors, um, maybe sometimes on temperature-dependent uncertainties, which we did include in that butane study, but um, don't always include activation energies in our analysis. Um, but it, but for, uh, particularly for larger fuels, thermodata is critical for predicting the equilibrium in the low-temperature branching routes and heat release as well. Um, So it's just a few examples here. Um, so this is this same uh, propane oxidation flame that we were simulating some microgravity experiments, um, just to, you know, to reiterate the, this importance of the species in the low temperature pathways. Um, there's uh, been um, quite a nice recent study, or a couple of recent studies coming from the Arkin group from, from LAME. Um, and uh, it's good to see that they're kind of consistent to the things that we were uh, expecting from work that we've done. So here they're looking at um, uncertainties in, the, again, the heat of formation at 298, um, also actually the enthalpy and the specific heat, so all the different uh, parameters that go into the model for um, diethyl ether oxidation mechanism. And, um, well, interestingly, they also see... Uh, much wider variance, and this is a log scale, much wider variance in this NTC region. Um, and um, the ranking of the, um, of the um, thermodynamic information in terms of importance here for the species is, is on, the, uh, on the right here. So, um, you know, again, we've got the alkyl radical, the RO2, the QOH, all of the fuel um, low temperature pathway species are highest ranking here. 
Then, of course, as we go down to the smaller molecule chemistry, it's all very well constrained through the AC, uh, ATCT tables. And so um, we don't expect to see that um, cropping up here. Um, also, a nice study from, uh, from the Arkin group, well, they actually looked at the impacts of um, values that were used for um, group additivity estimates on, on predictions. Um, and so this is, I, I mean, this is useful, particularly if we're using reaction mechanism generators where, you know, we are using group values for new fuels. Um, and so um, they, in looking at um, ignition delays for 2-methylheptane, um, they actually looked at the various different groups in the model that we use to estimate um, thermodynamic data and um, gave a ranking to those. So um, not surprisingly, it's actually groups involving um, oxygen that top this table. Okay, so um, there are emerging, ni nice emerging studies that are helping us to understand um, how different types of parameters are contributing to our model errors. So I suppose the next question is, what should we do about that? Well, so how do we go about improving our models? Um, so, um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's tricky. Um, historically, we, we've used tuning perhaps a little bit too much. Um, so, you know, we, we, we predict our experimental data. We just do a simple comparison against our model. Um, and then we say, oh, well, there's quite a big discrepancy. And we do a local sensitivity analysis and we pick out a reaction uh, that's quite important and then we might multiply it by a factor of two or four or five um, and get better agreement with the model and, um, and, um, and move forward from there. Um, so, and, and then um, I suppose as things move forward, um, we start to think about whether or not we can actually use our experimental data collectively uh, to help us constrain our model um, rather than using snapshots of experimental data, and that might be the way to go. So the traditional approach that we have is we do, we try to do kinetics, so we either determine rate coefficients um, experimentally by trying to isolate single reactions in our model, or we calculate them using the best level theory we can afford. Then we build our model and we put this data in, then we take indirect measurements, so things like laminar burning velocities, ignition delays, um, concentration profiles, and we use those to evaluate our model. Um, and then we go about tuning or not tuning or trying to publish a paper on it. Um, so um, this is, a, I guess, um, a process of building an evaluation. Um, and then statistical methods start, were starting to be used for looking at um, nice small systems. And so I talked about the multi-scale multi informatics for a couple of systems for DME um, and the hydrogen systems that Mike Burke has looked at. Um, but actually, we could think about the whole system in a, in a kind of um, unified way. Um, and so I guess maybe going to the future, the idea might be to bring all of this data together in, in an optimization framework to try and improve our models. So um, thinking back to the history of this, the GRI mech is an optimized mechanism. Everybody knows that, don't they? No? <laughs> yes, you do. You all know that. So the GRI mech is not a fundamental combustion mechanism. None of the rate constants in the GRI mech actually relate to specific studies like this, it was optimized against um, very broad ranges of, of, of data, mainly on flames. Okay, so it's, it is a fitted model. Um, theoretical data um, and direct measurements were not used as part of that optimi optimization. It was optimized against indirect measurements only. Um, oh, I think I've gone... A yeah, I've kind of gone a bit in the wrong order. Um, what, what I'm going to come on to later is how we um, might use all of this data, so direct data, theoretical data, and indirect data together in an optimization framework. Um, 
Yeah, that's, I've gone a bit, sorry, I've gone a bit out of order. I have a couple of slides here on model evaluation to go through before I come to optimization. Uh, the, the Budapest group, um, led by Thomas Turani, have um, done an awful lot of work in both of these areas. And so um, the way in which they proceed tends to be that they, they take a, uh, a fuel system of interest, um, they gather together all the mechanisms that might be um, in the literature to describe that fuel's oxidation, and then they go through a process of um, evaluation um, to, to, I suppose, establish which of the mechanisms give overall the best representation of the, of the large data sets available. And I think this is a better way of going about things than, you know, um, plotting um, models and data together and just eyeballing to see what the errors look like. What they're trying to do is put together a consistent framework for mechanism assessment um, using a range of um, error targets. So um, this one is based on um, the simulations minus the experiment, and it's all scaled by the experimental um, uncertainty. And this one is a, uh, some of the squares. Um, so this is a kind of typical L2 norm, and this is going to give you more information about the, the bias in the, in the model. Um, and then, let's skip forward. Um, what they do is they, they plot, they, they gather together huge amounts of uh, experimental data and calculate these error functions over the whole data set and then give us an overall average of the function value. Um, so um, these are, um, I think, for hydrogen. And actually, they plot this against time, which I find quite interesting. Because <laughs> what we should be seeing over time is the, error, the overall average error function of the mechanisms drop getting lower and lower and lower. If we're, if we're doing our job properly, mechanisms should improve in terms of their accuracy over time. Um, and um, so what's where on this? So this is GRI MEC here. It's, pretty, it's over 20 years old now. Um, and you know, there are mechanisms actually which have been worse than GRI that have been produced since then in terms of overall errors. But for the most part, errors um, have been dropping um, from recent studies. Um, and we are converging on something which is a, a good representation of the data. This is an example from ammonia um, mechanisms. So this is, these mechanisms have been developed more recently, so we wouldn't expect um, them to be as well constrained, of course, as the hydrogen scheme. Um, and actually, you can see that there are clear biases in some of the mechanisms uh, at different temperature regions here. Um, so um, the best of the mechanisms is Glarborgs from 2018 and Songs from 2019. Um, so that, that's a useful paper if you're modeling ammonia systems in, in looking at um, overall simulations from recent ammonia schemes. Okay, um, and then what happens next in the work is uh, usually they select um, one of the mechanisms that has the lowest overall error in comparison to the huge data set. And then they go about optimizing the parameters in that mechanism. Um, so this is a kind of, it's quite a large effort because um, first of all, they have to gather together all of the direct and indirect measurements that relate to that system. And in fact, um, usefully, they've put all these in a database um, on the Budapest website. Um, then they have to um, gather together uncertainty information on all the inputs um, because what we don't want to be doing is optimizing parameters outside of their range of uncertainty. Um, and then, of course, they have to simulate all that data, construct a response surface, and then optimize the model. So it is actually a, a really quite a big undertaking. Um, so the approach was uh, developed quite a long time ago in the 1990s by Frank Clark and co-workers. And, and it, Using indirect measurements was used to constrain the GRI MEC for methane. Um, I think I'm just making the point here that you know there's a lot of a lot of data being gathered since GRI MEC. Mechanisms are not static, and so we sh we should be using the best available mechanisms. And the Budapest Group have looked at a number of different fuel systems that will give us information on which are the best ones. So GRI MEC is standard in Chemkin, obviously. It's also standard in Open Foam, but it's not. 
necessarily the right reason to use it. Um, so the first example they looked at, unsurprisingly, then, was optimizing a scheme for hydrogen combustion. So here you can see the level of effort involved. So shock tube ignition delays, RCM ignition delays, hundreds of data points in 73 data sets. Laminar burning velocities, another 73 data sets. Jet steel reactors, nine data sets. Flow reactors, 17. So some poor student in Budapest has had to collect all this data and um, digitize it and um, store it in the Respect H database. Um, so for optimization, we're trying to cover um, as wide a range of temperatures and pressures and equivalence ratios as we can. And the, and the reason it goes back to, uh, I guess, my well, very first few slides from the first day, which is that for a model to be useful, it has to be able to extrapolate or, in, or at least interpolate, or you know, tell us something that we, we don't know already from experiment. So the broader range of conditions over which we optimize a model, the more generally applicable it will be. So we've got to be careful not to optimize models over you know, small data sets, because then when we use them outside of that optimization machine, they, they may or may not work. Um, so there are a number of different methods used for op optimization. Crucial to all of these is that a sensitivity analysis should be carried out first um, because we don't want to optimize parameters that have no sensitivity to any of the data sets because we don't have any information on them. So if there are parameters in the model that have no um, influence on predicting flame speeds or ignition delay times, we just leave them because we don't have any information to do anything better. So there's no point in, in optimizing them incorrectly. Um, so sensitivity analysis is carried out first, and then the most influential or the active parameters will be floated in the optimization. Uh, and there are, there are, you know, this is basically just minimizing some kind of cost function, right? So um, there are different ways in which you could do that. If you've already got a response surface from polynomial chaos methods, you can actually use that response surface um, in the optimization um, step. Um, Tom Ash's group use orthonormal polynomials and um, probably it's a, you know, ends up being a very similar approach. Um, so things to watch out for then are that the optimization should only be for sensitive parameters, otherwise the others will be changed with no basis. Um, a, a wider set of um, targets should be used. I would say at the moment for large um, systems, they're only really using direct and indirect measurements. Theory could also be incorporated into this approach. Um, and so then we're bringing everything um, together all the information we have on a, on a system to constrain it better. Um, surrogate models have to be used because there's a very large number of simulations involved. And, and uh, I guess there are probably still things to discuss around how this should be done. Should we do this in a hierarchical approach? Um, or, um, or should we optimize all the parameters together? Uh, I think uh, the hierarchical approach is used for the most part. Okay, so um, there's been quite a few different examples of this now from the Budapest group. You can have a look at their papers. Uh, this is the, the first the simple hydrogen. Thousands of samples were required. Um, they generated a response surface using orthonormal polynomials. And then we've got all these um, optimization targets. Um, and so this is um, a nice plot, I guess, of the error function value again for the hydrogen schemes and how it's decreasing with time, um, and I think at one point Thomas made a prediction of when we would get to zero error, but I think it was 2022, so I'm not sure we're there. But um, you can see that the optimized scheme has got the lowest error function value of all of these schemes, but actually they started with the Karamis mechanism, and actually even that was pretty good to start with, really. Okay, so um, they do improve on the Karamis mechanism, um, uh, 
you know, but, but these newer schemes are all pretty reasonable. Um, what's quite interesting about this um, is to look at the, um, the prior uncertainty limits in, in some of the rate parameters and the optimized ones. So um, the nominal rate coefficient that went, went into the model originally from the Koromnis scheme is the blue line. Um, the prior uncertainty limits are the dotted blue lines. And then following the optimization, so constraining the mechanism with all that data, we get the red line um, plus the uncertainties, which are the are dotted red lines. Okay, so if we take H plus O, H plus M, actually the optimized rate coefficient isn't that far away from the nominal one, which I suppose is satisfying. Um, but the, um, uh, the constraints are now much tighter. The same is true for H plus O, 2 plus M. Um, but actually, um, if we take uh, the reaction of HO2 plus H, although, well, so the, the fitted um, rate constant is very similar to the original one, but so is the level of uncertainty. So what that tells us is that it was only really, a, um, a, a, well, not really that much of a constraint posed by the experiments on this value. And for um, hydrogen peroxide plus H, the temperature dependence of the optimized rate coefficient is quite different from the prior. So that suggests there was uncertainty in the activation energy there. Uh, ooh. <laughs> Do I want to go through correlated sensitivities? Um, sorry, I just think how much time I had left. So. For the most part, when we're, um, we're propagating uncertainties, the methods are based on the fact that um, the input parameters are not correlated. But the output from this type of study is actually a joint probability distribution for the uh, input parameters to the mechanism. So everything's correlated. Um, so do we even want to do sensitivity analysis on, on, on a correlated parameter set? It's actually quite tricky to do. Um, but one of the things we should be careful is that we're not, that we, that if we're propagating uncertainties, we do take account of that uh, correlation. Otherwise, we will overestimate the uncertainties. Um, well, <laughs> um, this is, it's a bit tricky to explain, really, to be honest. So if we've got a correlated input um, sample, we can't just use the sort of standard um, variance-based sensitivity um, methods as they were because they're all based on the assumption that the parameters are independent. Um, if we want to look at correlated parameters, then we first have to use a transformation to uncorrelate them. And that means that the, the sensitivities that we get out are actually marginal sensitivities. Um, and uh, their values will depend on um, the order in which we, we did the um, uncorrelation. Um, it is a bit tricky to explain, but the important part of this is that when we, go, when we do this transformation for a highly optimized scheme like that hydrogen scheme, um, what we find is when we, when we get to the end of the marginal sensitivities, um, we've got the uncorrelated sensitivity coefficient for each parameter. They are extremely small. Um, so, if we look at this, the correlated indices are at the top here, and the uncorrelated ones, so this is what's the remaining sensitivity in this model for this parameter treated independently, is really small. So, this is a log scale, so even the ones which look quite large are still, you know, less than 0.1. So, what does that actually mean practically? Um, it means that now if we bring any new experimental data to this optimized model, um, we shouldn't kind of use it to, um, to tune any parameter individually because these parameters are also highly correlated that we should, we should use any new information to re-optimize the whole thing. So that's sort of tricky because it's quite a big effort to re-optimize the whole thing. Um, does that make sense? 
not so easy to understand, but it does sort of feed into the next thing I want to talk about. Let me just uh, keep running into this. I should have turned off the night thing, shouldn't I? Is that, can you actually see that? I'll do it at the break. Um, uh, which is um, to think about optimizing systems as a whole. So this is really, I guess, uh, the opposite end of the spectrum to kinetics, where I, I said right at the beginning, you know, in kinetics, we're trying to isolate uh, a given parameter in the kinetics experiment so that we can only optimize that one parameter. But actually, um, uh, there, there is also some merit uh, in optimizing against large numbers of target data sets, um, as the Budapest group have been doing. Um, uh, so what does that mean in terms of choosing experiments that we should add to our um, information pool? Um, and so there's, I suppose there's an, em an, an emerging sort of uh, train of thought in, in combustion now that we, we, we probably should be thinking about using techniques from design of experiments approaches. Um, so instead of you know, just doing an experiment because it's nice, because we fancy it, um, uh, maybe doing some well, doing some analysis first to say what experiments should we be doing that most add information content and that will help us constrain our model to the maximum extent. Okay, so um, I guess I, I, I've said earlier in the week, it you know it's, it is useful to simulate experiments first because that will help us in this design of experiments approach. I mean, you know, maybe people are using design of experiments type software in, in other ways. I don't know. I mean, we use it for, um, uh, for um, trying to minimize the number of experiments that we're doing on fuel blend properties, for example. So the rough idea behind it, if you haven't met it before, is that you, um, you do a small sample first of your experiments. Um, then you construct a response surface. Um, and then you say, well, okay, which regions of that response surface uh, would most benefit from more information? And so there, I should do more experiments in that particular region, and that will help me constrain my model of the system further. Um, so, you know, uh, okay, we, if we're looking at Flashpoint, then our model's really simple. It's just a, it's just a second-order polynomial. The, the hydrogen model is a bit more complicated than that, and for other fuels, of course, it's even worse. So it is a bit more tricky to think about it from the point of view of kinetics models. Um, but people are starting to do this. Um, so again, this comes from the Arkin group. <laughs> They're doing quite a lot of good stuff. It's annoying. No, it's not annoying. It's great. Um, so um, what they're doing here um, is... Um, I guess what they're, what they're doing is, uh, is, is hypothesizing experiments and then saying um, which of those experiments is giving me the maximum information content. And now, um, instead of optimizing just um, you know, a single PDF, we're optimizing a whole, we're trying to optimize a whole um, distribution of parameters. And so we're trying to minimize across a joint PDF. And, and so um, we have to think about this in terms of a, a multivariate normal distribution. I'm not sure that the math is that important, really. You can go and read the paper. Um, but basically, th this, this, um, contain, this matrix contains important information about the joint uncertainty space of all the parameters that we might want to optimize. Um, and we want the most efficient way of minimizing these joint parameter uncertainties. Okay, so. Each iteration in the method will start with an evaluation of um, all of the not yet selected possible exper experiments that we could do. Um, we then, we we're not doing the experiments, so we have to kind of estimate what the experimental outcome will be from the, from the uh, previous iteration of the model. Um, and then um, we're trying to... Um, minimize the determinant of that matrix, which is giving us information about the whole joint probability um, distribution. So um, it comes from basic um, design of experiment theory. So it's e equivalent um, to minimizing the Shannon entropy of the system. It makes more sense if we actually look at what, what happens. So um, this is done in a kind of an iterative way. And so 
what, what this um, diagram shows here is um, possible experiments for measuring ignition delays of DME combustion. Um, the green is what are the first five experiments that would give us the most information. Okay, so this is um, as a function of temperature and equivalence ratio um, and also pressure. So it's saying, okay, if you can only afford five experiments, um, do it at these temperatures at 25 to 30 bar and 12 to 13 bar, uh, equivalence ratios which cover lean to rich conditions. Okay, so these are low temperature experiments at two different pressures. Okay, and the first iteration then, which is these five experiments, um, takes the prior uncertainty from the, the pink uh, distribution here down to that red line. So just by carrying out five experiments, that's really narrowed that um, uncertainty in the NTC region. Okay, then um, go back and apply the method again. I don't know why they've gone from five to 20, but this is basically the next 15 experiments, which are the black um, symbols on here. Um, and at the second iteration, so sorry, the, the, the night light's making this a bit more tricky to understand now, but um, is narrowing this um, overall uncertainty more. So I think this is blue. Um, and then if we can afford up to 50 experiments, then we add in uh, the red symbols, and that gets us to the third iteration, which narrows the distribution even further. And if we can afford 127 experiments, then we get down to this um, darker shaded region here, which has really constrained the model um, quite well, um, even in the NTC region. Okay, so um, the plot on the bottom left here is giving us the two sigma in predictions. So again, that sort of measure of the variance in the predictions as a function of the number of iterations that we're doing. You can see that you get the most information content at the start of the experiments. And then you get to a stage where each experiment's not adding a whole lot of information, right? So you might, well, if you're doing a PhD, you might go, oh, okay, that's good enough. I can, I'll write up now or whatever, or write a paper. So it's basically saying, you know, experiments are a lot of effort. So maybe we should be being a bit cleverer about how we're using that time um, and design our, and, you know, come up with our experimental design in an iterative way. So in terms of the response surface, um, the, the way the, the um, DOE methods normally work is, is that, you know, if you, if you have a totally linear response, you're not going to need many experiments, right, to, to fully um, constrain your model. It's where you've got non-linearity in the response that you probably need to have more experiments. And of course, we do expect that really in combustion models because they are in inherently non-linear. Has everyone got the vague gist of that? <laughs> yeah, I know, it's been a long week. <laughs> um, okay, so I've... Um, hmm. We're not going to have too long to talk about model reduction. Um, so uh, the point I want to make here, I suppose, is that um, can we... We don't really do this, but we do... Well, we do do it to an extent, and we have done it a bit historically. We have historically a little bit worked in these silos, right? So, you know, we've got all the theory people here, and we've got the detailed kinetics experiments, he uh, experiments here, and the people who use models to simulate devices here. Um, and, we, and the people who understand statistics here. And, and uh, over the years, there's been more crossover, of course, between these different areas. But I think we could get further um, more quickly if we you know, try to enhance the interaction uh, between these different areas. It's not always easy because everyone speaks different languages. Uh, I, don't, I mean scientific languages. Um, but um, luckily, everyone does speak English, right? So that's not a problem for me. But... Uh, um, so, um, uh, yeah, this is not, not to be critical of, of, of anyone, but really just saying that to do things optimally and to use our time best does require collaboration across these boundaries as a community and to combine modelling, experimental design, statistical methods, etc., cetera, um, together. Um, and, you know, that's partly what the multiscale informatics approaches are trying to do um, and also what you know, um, the optimization groups are trying to do is to bring all this stuff together. Um, so I think maybe that is a good time to take a break.
And I've just got one last section after the break on model reduction, which uh, there's a lot to get through in an hour, so that will be a quick overview. We're down to the last section, the last hour of the course this week. Um, well, I'm going to talk about uh, model reduction. Um, so, well, I suppose the problem, the problem is, is that all the people who might need to use model reduction because they're doing CFD are going to be in the other session um, talking about CFD. But, um, so, yeah, I mean, the reasons why model reduction is necessary, I suppose, is obvious. Um, uh, Probably as kineticists, we've spent our life trying to make models more detailed, um, improve them, and as a result, they become more complex. Um, but actually, um, practical devices, of course, are three-dimensional, include turbulent reacting flows, and um, uh, those models can't afford to include the level of detail that we put in, into our models. And so the, the, the challenge, I suppose, well, I suppose there's a competition, really, Either we have to simplify the descriptions of the, um, the physical flow um, or, the, or the spatial resolution of our models, or we have to simplify the chemistry. Um, my impression is, is that the CFD guys are, uh, are very keen on simplifying chemistry rather than simplifying uh, their turbulence modeling. So um, we have to do uh, some work, I think, probably to help them out in terms of trying to develop ways in which we can include the relevant chemical information in more detailed models, um, but at a much lower computational cost. And there are a number of different ways in which we might do that. And there probably are, um, you know, different stages, really, of, of model reduction that we might go through in, in terms of, you know, finally developing um, a computationally efficient scheme. Um, the first and probably the simplest to understand conceptually is skeletal model reduction. So we've got our, our mechanisms, and um, we can predict um, chemical changes over wide ranges of concentration, pressure, temperature. Um, and then um, we can use methodologies to try and figure out whether there are any species and reactions in our scheme that are not required to accurately simulate desired targets. Um, and if, if we can find reactions which are redundant in this way, then we can remove them from the scheme. Um, I, I guess the point to make you is this, if we're going to apply the methods that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, we've got to be very careful that we apply them over broad ranges of um, composition, um, pressure and temperature, so that they are widely applicable in a CFD model. Um, because um, in, a, in a model of a practical device, you know, if you're modeling a gas turbine, you're likely to be covering large temperature ranges. Um, Maybe even in some devices, quite wide ranges of pressure, and certainly, um, of course, you know, rich, rich zones, lean zones, differences in composition. So, if we're going to give a reduced model to um, CFD people, we've got to have tested it over um, uh, quite broad ranges of conditions. Um, the second thing that we may be able to exploit in model reduction is the fact that in our chemical models we do have a wide range of species. Um, going from highly reactive radicals to more stable products. And so there is a huge range of timescales in our models. If we don't do anything about this, and the downside of that is it creates stiffness in the equation systems, which makes them more expensive to solve if we try to resolve all those timescales. But the, the good side of this, the positive side of this, is we can exploit these timescale variabilities um, and come up with methods uh, where we equilibrate the fast time scales with respect to the slower species. And usually, there's ways of actually, therefore, removing them from our equation system. And therefore, we can, you know, using these time scale based methods, we can reduce um, the number of variables in our, in our model. And therefore, the number of variables that would go into a CFD model, reducing the chemical effort, and also the number of variables that they need to transport in the, in the flow part of their code. So um, I'll show you briefly how timescales can be exploited. Um, other approaches might be to, um, to lump information together in our models. This can be applied to reactions or species based on different principles, so we'll go over that briefly. Um, so reaction lumping, which is linked to timescale um, information, 
um, and species lumping, um, which is lumping together species based on their reactive or structural similarities. Again, this is a, a, a reduction in um, numbers of species. And, and if this doesn't get as far enough um, in terms of you know, reducing the number of species to a level that we can afford to use the CFD, then we can think about other ways of representing the chemistry. Um, so as kineticists, maybe this isn't ideal for us, but actually either tabulated or functional representations of the chemistry can be a way um, to really efficiently include chemical information um, in CFD models. So it's a way of retaining the information from the detailed chemistry in some other mathematical form. Um, and um, whilst it's not you know, particularly useful for understanding the chemistry of the system, it, it, it can be useful for, for really reducing the computational cost. Okay, so let, let's start with um, skeletal reduction. So this is really where you begin if, you start, if you're starting out with a comprehensive chemical model. Um, you, you probably know uh, for yourself what the important species are, so they might be your starting reactants, obviously, in any major products that you're interested in. Um, but actually, in between uh, the reactants and products, there are going to be, of course, a huge number of intermediates. Um, and um, finding out which of those intermediates and which of the reactions in the network are necessary um, is um, a way of... Um, potentially figuring out the, where the redundant parts of the mechanism are that can then be removed without any loss of um, predictive accuracy. So um, these methods are based really on, on um, categorizing couplings between species. So if we take uh, these three important species to start with, then we're looking at the connections through reactions to um, their closest neighbors in the reaction network and trying to determine whether the um, fluxes are significant, and if they are, then these become necessary species and get added to our model. But we might find um, certain species that are only very weakly coupled to our necessary and important ones, and these ones um, we might be able to remove from our model. And, it, and it's important to look at species in groups, actually, because sometimes we find that um, you know, we might see some fast e equilibration between two species, so the flux between them is large. But the flux between these um, uh, species and the rest of the network is very weak, and so we can just get rid of them. So this is, these are kind of um, network, I guess, based approaches, which is um, where the direct relation graph reduction uh, method comes from. So this is um, uh, a method developed by Professor Law here, actually, at Princeton. Um, so, again, so, you know, just to reiterate, this is looking at um, a reaction network, which is actually now being represented as a, a graph network, and each node in the um, directed relation graph will represent a species. And then we construct um, an edge um, from vertex A to B, and uh, we look at the flux between the two species. Okay, so um, what we're trying to do is... is um, calculate some kind of connection weight between the species and compare that to uh, a threshold to decide whether or not that we need to keep that connection. Um, and then as we go through the network, that will determine whether or not we keep each um, species as being necessary or whether sets of species in the network can become decoupled. Okay, so um, this is based really then on um, connected weights, which are functions of um, the rate of... Um, reaction between the um, two species compared to the overall net rate of reaction. And um, there have been quite a number of different um, uh, variants of the DRG method over the years. So um, one of the earlier developments was using um, a maximum norm in the um, threshold, well, in the connected weights equation to compare against thresholds. The uh, second development was um, using a restart method, so using a sort of several-step method to do the reduction. So maybe using a, 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 um, a, a fairly loose threshold to start with um, and then reducing further by tightening the threshold on a second iteration. And actually, the, the structure of the graph network will change 
um, after the first set of redundant species have been removed. Um, this is a slightly different application, which is using the same approach to look at transport fluxes in flames. Um, DR yeah, I don't quite get the terminology here, but DRG-aided sensitivity analysis is another method, but actually I, I don't think it's a sensitivity method. But what it does do is it includes the testing of simulation error for the proposed mechanisms um, with tighter and tighter thresholds so that you've got um, a way of choosing what the right threshold is. So th the problem with some of these reduction methods is we're setting these thresholds, but what we're really interested in is the actual accuracy of predicting our target outputs. But there isn't a direct connection between the, cho the threshold choice and that predictive error. So we, do have, we have to test the mechanisms um, and compare against either the full model for our predictions and then maybe choose a threshold based on those um, predictive errors. Okay, so that's what um, DRG ASA does. I'm not quite sure where it's a sensitivity analysis technique, um, but it is a useful uh, development. And then there's uh, DRG with error propagation. Uh, so what this does is it um, um, that dampens the errors as we propagate from the initially selected important species further and further away from them through the network. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I think actually DRG is coded into Chemkin as a, as a, a reduction method, and so um, it's fairly straightforward to apply. I think just the thing, the caveat to watch out for is that you've carefully selected your important species to start with, and that you, you run it over um, all temperatures, pressures, compositions that you, you want to use the reduced mechanism. And actually, these, these uh, model reduction, um, skeletal model reduction techniques are pretty successful usually. Usually, there's a, a, you know, a lot of information in our, react, in our reaction mechanisms which um, is redundant. So typically, um, in papers and in, in our own experience, you get a factor of three reduction in species and reactions when you, when you apply these methods. Okay, so a factor of three reduction in species is a factor of nine reduction in the computational effort to solve the system. Um, probably connected to that is um, the use of a kind of concentration sensitivity type um, method. So um, this was developed by Thomas Charanya's group in Budapest. I was involved in some of the early work here as well. Um, so this is basically calculating an index BI, which is um, a fun well, it's a sum of functions of the influence of changing concentration of species I on um, the rate of production of all the other species in the reaction network, and then it's normalized according to this term here. Um, so this is an iterative technique. We start out with our important species in the, in the sum here, and then um, we will find that um, certain species have a very important influence on that group of important ones, and then we add them into the sum, um, and we keep iterating until we get a, a large gap where the rest of the species are uncoupled from our network of important and necessary ones. Um, so um, initially, this was a sort of kind of a manual approach, I guess, for uh, in, in running this in an iterative way, um, and looking for these gaps in the, in the BI values to, to find cutoffs. Um, more recently, um, the Budapest group have again added um, um, an error minimization um, step to this, where they actually then simulate and compare against the full model and decide whether thresholds should be based on um, a simulation error. So there are differences, actually, between these methods in terms of the number of um, species that they remove for a given simulation error. Um, so the original version of the um, connectivity method actually doesn't do that well in terms of re reducing numbers of species. Um, the, the better methods are, um, the, are the DRG with error propagation um, and the uh, DRG sensitivity analysis method and the connectivity method with um, the simulation error part. And so you can see, if we start, we start out with 150 species, the better of the methods 
can get down as far as um, 50, 40, 50, 60 species for only a 5% error in simulation. Okay, so a factor of three reduction. Um, so that's nice, and if we're interested in kinetics, that might be useful to us because we want to kind of keep the reaction network because we might want to know uh, what's going on chemically. Um, but it's probably not going to be significant enough a reduction for the CFD people. So then we move on to the, I guess, the second uh, set of methods which are based on these time scale ranges. Um, so as I say, if we, if we leave these alone, this range of time scales that we see in the chemistry are problematic. Um, so if you remember on day one, I talked about the Jacobian of the rate matrix. Um, if the eigenvalues of that Jacobian span orders of magnitude, these equation systems become expensive to solve using normal methods. So we either have to develop clever numerical methods or, or we have to get, somehow get rid of these fast time scales. Um, but actually, um, what we find is that these fast time scales um, very quickly um, become in local equilibrium with the slower ones. And so we don't really need to represent their dynamics. They just basically us enslaved, I suppose, to the slower variables. So we only really need to solve for the slower variables. And actually, if we do that, we can probably come up with some kind of analytical function to give us the fast species back if we need them. So there's actually quite a lot to exploit here in terms of um, you know, reducing our mechanisms based on time scale approaches. Um, so, well, I'll just put in some um, plots here to show you how that might look um, for a particular system. So this was um, basically simulations of a hydrogen-oxygen flame. Uh, it's a long story, but basically we, we, um, we recast the model um, as a, um, a time-dependent set of equations, so a set of trajectory equations for the flame. Um, so what, we're, what I'm plotting here is, um, I guess, what we call a phase plot for the system. So this is plotting the... Um, uh, I can't remember if it's mass or mole fraction, doesn't really matter, of water against temperature. And so oh, as we go along the trajectories, what, what, what of course will happen is we end up at um, the equilibrium point where we see the adiabatic flame temperature. Um, but what you can see is, is that basically if we, if we move back down to lower temperatures, um, that all the trajectories are converged onto this um, one-dimensional manifold that then approaches the equilibrium. And um, if we think about this in terms of dimensionality, the second plot is slightly better. So the, 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 the blue line is the, the final kind of passage to the equilibrium point in the flame, and that's just a one-dimensional curve. So actually, you know, down to about, um, what's that, about 1,000 Kelvin, this system is one-dimensional. Um, if we want to go to lower temperatures, then... Um, the dimension of the, of, of the manifold increases. Um, so um, the red is two-dimensional, the green three-dimensional. But we can get down to quite low temperatures with just a three-dimensional model. And what you can see is, is that all the trajectories are um, converging um, quite um, quickly to that um, lower-dimensional manifold. So they're kind of equilibrating with respect to the slow motion along... Uh, that lower dimensional manifold. So depending on the um, range of temperatures we want to represent, we could use a 1D manifold to give us that uh, high temperature region, or a 2D would take us down to lower, or maybe 3D if we really wanted those um, initial reactions uh, from the cold um, part of the flame. Okay, so depending on the temperature space that we're trying to model, different reduced models could be developed, which are of a lower dimension um, than the initial model, which was, I think, nine-dimensional. So. Um, so the question is, so we, we know that these low-dimensional manifolds exist. They exist in all combustion systems. Everything collapses usually very quickly um, onto some lower-dimensional space from the initial conditions. The question is, how do we actually exploit that in terms of creating a reduced model so the, the, the method that we're used to seeing, I think, is a quasi-steady state approximation. It's probably a, in most undergraduate textbooks, I would guess. Um, 
actually goes all the way back to the start of the 20th century, to Bodenstein in 1913. Um, <coughs> in the, in the quasi-steady state assumption, um, we're associating timescales directly with species. Um, and we're saying, OK, some species uh, are very, react very quickly and very quickly become um, equilibrated with respect to the slower species. So we can exploit that as a way of um, removing them from our equation system. Um, so how do we know which are the QSA, QSSA species? Well, there's been a number of uh, different methods to, to calculate the error in applying the QSSA. I've put this one in here because uh, this was work that Tomash and I did together. Um, so we, um, we came up with um, a simple estimation for QSSA error, which is a function of the rate of change of species YI with time multiplied by um, the inverse of uh, the diagonal Jacobian element for species I. Okay, so this is sort of related, partially related to the eigenvalues in the system, I suppose. Um, and um, so what this is saying is, is that if you have a large um, Jaco diagonal Jacobian element for that species, then um, the QSSA error is going to be small. Or if its um, rate of change with respect to time is low, um, then the error is going to be small. But actually, um, if, if the Jacobian um, diagonal is large, this doesn't necessarily need to be small. Okay, so. Um, this is consistent with a small error for species that are consumed in fast reactions. Um, in, in these kind of conditions, the local production rate of the QSSS species can actually be large, which is a bit counterintuitive, but nevertheless, it, it works. So what we mean by a quasi-steady state is that um, the concentrations of these species that can change, we're not saying that they are constant with time, but what we're saying is, is that they change um, in a kind of way which is enslaved to the slow species. So if the slow species oscillate, then so will the quasi-steady state ones, for example. So how does this work in practice? Um, well, let's just take a simple example of A reacting reversibly uh, to B, and then B going on to uh, create products uh, C. So we can write down the rate of change of B. I, I, put, I left that out, so I added that in this morning because I thought it was probably important to include it. Um, but it'll be in the online notes, I guess. So we can write down the rate of change of species B uh, with time um, as a function of the rates of the different reactions. And now we're saying, okay, that we'll, we've established that B has a very um, low QSSA error. Um, and so... Um, the way in which we apply the QSSA is to set this right-hand side to be equal to zero. Okay, so we can, when we do that, we can rearrange um, the equation and we can define B as a function of the concentration of A. And what we've got now is this kind of, uh, this new rate constant, which is a function of um, the forward and reverse rates here and the, and the rate going to products C. Okay, so we can also right now, uh, we can substitute that into the rate equation for dc by dt. Um, and actually, in this particular simple case, um, the, the, the new uh, rates um, for uh, dA by dt and dc by dt are equivalent to defining a new reaction where A just basically goes directly to the product C and has um, this rate... Um, which is dependent on all of the initial rates from the reaction model at the beginning. So this is kind of a lumped reaction. Uh, we've, we've, we've kind of lumped out our species B. But if we want species B and we want the concentration of it, um, we can still get that back from this algebraic equation that we've got here. So if we're solving the reaction network now just for A and C, and we've lost that species, um, we've still got information about B. Um, from this algebraic equation. Um, and the other thing to point out is that this is now um, a kind of global one-step reaction or whatever, but the reaction rate for this is not um, K2. It's actually K, uh, a nonlinear function of all of the original rates. 
So you still need the original model with all of the rate constants in, but you can remove one species um, and not lose any information at all. Okay, so um, that's, been, that's just a very simple system. Um, that's been applied to some quite large models, actually. Um, so Norbert Peters, or I think it was Peters and Rog, um, applied th th this kind of QSSA type approach to a large number of fuel systems um, in a book that they published in 1993 um, and came up with um, quite a lot of, of reaction models of a very, very reduced number of steps. Um, but uh, the important thing about it is, is that actually in their derivations, there are all these very complicated lumped rate constants. Um, and so um, although the reaction sequences look quite simple, the rate constants for them are, 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 have got all of the original information embedded. Um, another way of going about it is to, to um, apply these types of uh, USSA approaches and then to actually just fit that rate constant for the lump, for the lump reaction to the full model. Um, so in fact, I don't know if there's anyone still here from Surfax, but this is, a, this is um, the two-step uh, propane model that I found in the Surfax website. Um, and um, here there's just a single Arrhenius um, parameter for each of the reactions. And so I would suggest that these are fitted um, global reaction rates. And what you can see here is, is that these are not elementary reactions anymore. Um, there are non-integer stoichiometries in these, in these reactions. Okay, so um, I guess the warning is, is that um, if you're using these heavily reduced one, two, three step chemistry routines, be aware that they, theoretically, they have been de derived by applying all these QSSA approximations for the rapidly equilibrating <laughs> intermediates. And that actually, um, the rate constants should include all that information. Um, also, um, you know, many of them are based on fairly old chemical schemes. The original Peters and Rog book is early 1990s. So that's not the most up-to-date uh, chemistry for the fuels anymore. Um, so it's just something to watch out for if, you, if you're using these global reaction schemes. Anybody here is? Um, Another way of exploiting timescales is um, through trying to define the dynamics of our system on these reduced manifolds. So I showed you one for the hydrogen flame. Um, there are many applications of, of um, intrinsic low dimensional manifold methods in the literature. So this is a very similar a plot, or it's a fancier one because it's 3D, but um, for, a, um, I think it was a wet CO system. Um, so you can see here lots of trajectories from starting initial conditions, but they're all collapsing. First of all, onto uh, this 2D surface within the system, and then they're all collapsing onto this 1D manifold, and then there's the passage to the final equilibrium. Um, so um, the question is, um, first of all, how do we define where that manifold is in the, in the composition phase space? And secondly, how do we actually um, define the equations that will give us uh, the chemical motion along that manifold? And so that's the basis of, of a large number of papers on, on ILDM methods. Um, so again, it, it's sort of, um, but, well, based on the system timescales. Um, so these methods are, are designed, I suppose, to be applied in any general reaction diffusion system um, really, as, as, as we're interested really in the chemical part, we're only interested in, in F here, um, which is the chemical source term. And in fact, computationally, um, operator splitting is quite often used. And so the flow um, parts of the model will be solved. Um, and then the chemical part of the model will be solved separately in the same time scale. And that means that we can um, come up with re uh, reduction methods for the for the chemical uh, part of the model that, um, that can be applied within this um, reactive flow framework. Um, so 
if we separate out that source term equation, then what we're trying to do is find a reduced representation of this. Um, and um, the formulation of the ILDM is based on uh, separating um, the system into three parts representing different subspaces with different timescales. So we have a, um, a conserved, um, we have a set of conserved variables. So usually they would be like elements that are conserved in the system, total number of hydrogen atoms or total number of oxygen atoms. Um, we've got um, our fast subspaces then, which will relate at least to you know, fast species that are rapidly collapsing onto the low dimensional manifold. And then we've got the slow variables, which are actually what are determining the sort of dynamics of the whole system. So um, what we want to do then in the same way um, as for QSSA, we want to equilibrate those fast time scales and then project them um, onto a set of equations which describes the slow subspace. And it's the slow subspace which is describing the, the dynamics of the chemistry. So um, conceptually, the main difference is here that we are we're kind of transforming the variables of our system so that each variable is represented by a single time scale. Um, so in the QSSA, um, it, each species was kind of connected with the time scale, but now um, we've, we're actually transforming our variables. Um, and that can be advantageous because sometimes there's more fast variables than there are QSSA species. Um, the other method which uh, I guess is related here is um, the rate controlled uh, constrained equilibrium method. So right back at the beginning of the week, talking about Gibbs free energy and saying um, that the equilibrium of our system is, is when we minimize the free energy of the mixture. So that, that gives us the equilibrium point. So what happens if we want then to represent you know, the passage to that equilibrium? Well, then we need to add kinetics back. Um, but actually, we don't need to add kinetics back for all of the species because some of them equilibrate very quickly. Um, so um, in the RCCE method, we're minimizing the free energy of the mixture, but subject to additional constraints, um, which are um, for species where we, we need to represent the, the chemical kinetics. Um, and these, the methods are conceptually different, I suppose. One of, one of them is based on kin kinetics understanding, really, and the other on, on a, some kind of thermodynamic understanding. But the constrained species in RCCE are often equivalent to uh, the slow, non-quasi-steady state species um, in the other method. Um, so the RCCE method is... Uh, analogous to really invariant manifolds. Geometrically, all of these methods are quite similar, and they're all based on the collapse of those fast trajectories onto some slower, um, lower dimensional subspace. Um, I don't know if there's much more I want to say about this slide. I mean, I think the, the trick to applying some of these methods is um, to define optimal um, constraint species. So to define species which will represent best the slow subspace. Okay, so for, for each of these methods, um, we've got two choices. We can either say, well, you know, I can, I can afford to represent three variables, and so I'll just do the best I can with a three-dimensional manifold, or we can try to define um, what the intrinsic dimensionality of the system is um, for the conditions that we're looking at. Um, and to do that, we need uh, to look at the timescales of our system. Um, so here, we're, we're, we're applying a transformation of the variables um, so that in the, in the transformed system, each of the, the variables is connected to a single timescale, so, and that will relate to an eigenvalue of the system. So um, for anything that's um, conserved, uh, the eigenvalue will be extremely small. So eigenvalues that are close to zero 
are representative of conserved processes like, you know, conserve the number of atoms. Um, uh, anything where the eigenvalue is very large and negative means that that time scale is rapidly equilibrating. So those are the time scales that we want to get rid of. Um, and the rest are basically the slow processes that we're keeping to describe the dynamics. So um, if we want to understand the intrinsic dimensionality, then um, we can kind of do a linearization of the problem and look at the eigenvalues and then try to find gaps in the eigenvalue spectrum. So uh, what we would hope would be that there will be this group of uh, variables with large negative eigenvalues and then a big gap to the, the smaller um, eigenvalues in the system. And we can say, OK, look, we, can, we can collapse down those um, rapidly equilibrating modes of the system and just keep dynamic information about the slow modes. So um, there are various different um, uh, groups and methods which are basically using the same concepts. So the, the CSP method, which was developed at Princeton, actually, by Harvey Lam and Dimitri Gousis, also uses a, a similar approach with a slightly different formulation. Um, so we can, um, we can apply these uh, types of reductions because of the fact that we very often use operator splitting uh, in our models to separate out solving the flow and solving the chemistry. Um, is that, I mean, actually, um, in the sense of solving the problem, we have to think about the fast chemical timescales, even if we're not doing reduction. Um, so the, the suggestion is that um, we solve the flow first, um, you know, diffusion, turbulent mixing, advection, etc., cetera, um, and that flow will kind of move the system away from the intrinsic manifold, and then we solve the chemical steps and the chemistry will collapse the system back. Um, but if we want to do reduction, then we can just replace um, the chemical part by um, our low-dimensional manifold um, representation of the problem. Uh, so the question is, how do we do that? Um, most often, these methods are, are, are coupled with some way of tabulating um, the chemical um, dynamic information on that manifold. So either using tables of um, pre-derived quantities or, or by fitting something like um, a polynomial response surface. And that can really, really speed up our simulation. Um, OK, I'll come back to the sort of fitting and tabulation a bit later on. Where's, what's the time? Yikes. Um, OK, uh, so um, the next method we're going to look at is lumping. We'll, just, we'll look at this very quickly. I might skip through some slides. Just to give you what the concept is. So I've already talked about reaction lumping. Um, usually, reaction lumping is related to the, um, species in the middle of the reaction sequence being fast equilibrating. And so we can lump reactions together. Um, and if we need to, define algebraic equations for those QSSA species. So I would call that um, um, vertical lumping. I haven't written it vertically, but I'm thinking of the reaction network going down the page, I suppose. Um, and then and the other way of applying lumping is uh, to lump species together. So to say, well, OK, if we've got um, structural similarities and, and similar reaction sequences for our species, Maybe we can lump them all together and, and reduce the number of variables that we're going to solve for. Um, so therefore, compressing the mechanism further. So um, the advantages of, of, of lumping are that we can get quite dramatic reductions in the number of variables, the number of equations we need to solve. Um, and actually, we can combine lumping with um, timescale analysis to reduce system stiffness. Um, and that's going to give us computational speed, uh, speed up, um, and also for the CFD people, it's less species to transport in the flow part of the code. Um, the downside is, is that um, what, if we start applying lumping within the, um, the rate equations, it's not necessarily always possible to translate that back to give us a, 
a nice kinetic scheme that we can understand as a sequence of reaction steps. So, you know, sometimes we just have to apply it mathematically um, rather than, you know, being able to understand the resulting chemistry. Um, if we, if we um, lump variables together, if we don't have a way of kind of inverting that process, then we might lose information on individual species. Sometimes that matters and sometimes it doesn't. But if, we, if we're transforming the, spe the um, species into a lump variable, sometimes we might need the inverse transformation to get our original species information back. Um, same thing, I guess. <coughs> um, and, if, and one of the tricky things about lumping is, is if we do group species together into a lump, how do we define the reaction rates for those lumped compounds? Because they're not kind of real things. Um, but actually, lumping has been very successfully applied in, in, in um, reducing chemical mechanisms, um, mostly using chemical lumping. Okay, so in chemical lumping, what we're, what we're doing is using information around our chemical knowledge of the species, like structural similarities or similar um, reaction classes that isomers might go through, um, and finding ways to group them together on that basis. Um, mathematical lumping, uh, which is the thing I worked on when I was a postdoc at Princeton, is based on um, looking for mathematical rules to reduce the dimensionality of a system. Um, I would say probably this has not been applied to the same extent as chemical lumping has. Um, so, well, we talked about reaction classes uh, a lot earlier in the week. Um, sometimes in complex fuel reaction systems, you know, we've got isomers that are involved in the same reaction classes, and they may have similar rate constants, um, um, and we may be able to define lumps for those isomers. Um, so the pathways for each isomer and the, and the resulting intermediate radicals might be lumped to give a simplified scheme. Um, I'm thinking, you know, quite often we have a, a lump peroxy radical, for example, in atmospheric models and in combustion models. Um, so all of those intermediate sequences in the, in the low temperature chemistry, there's, there's often an attempt to lump the isomers. And this is um, an approach which is commonly used by the group at Polimi in Milan, um, and it's quite often embedded in their mechanism generation codes. So a very simple example of this would be... Um, an alkyl plus O2 giving us proxy radicals, four different isomers, um, defining a lumped radical, which is basically just the sum of the four isomers, um, and um, then giving us you know, a single reaction to give us a lumped RO2 species. Um, so in this simple system, we can define um, an overall reaction rate for that reaction, but it, it depends on the initial concentrations of those um, different isomers. Um, the other way of doing this is basically to fit um, a rate constant for the lump reaction based on running the full scheme. So, um, as I say, this is used very commonly in the Milan um, mechanism generation codes. Um, so, in their codes, you quite often see uh, these lumped reactions that have, again, non-stoichiometric coefficients, so they, they don't look anything like the... Oh, hello. They don't... <laughs> what's the time? Um, they don't look anything like the um, elementary reactions that we're used to seeing in chemical models. So um, these types of approaches have been used quite successfully um, in quite a lot of mechanism generation um, environments. So for N-heptane, for example, as a paper by uh, the French group at Nancy, the, the, the full version of the N-heptane scheme um, had 400 radicals, so 400 radical intermediates, um, and, 700, and 70 stable molecules, um, taking part in over 1,500 reactions. Uh, once you lump those intermediate isomers, then that leaves only 25 radicals, 
um, in 189 reactions. So that's a massive saving in terms of the computational cost of that lump mechanism. Um, and um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but the, the XGAS software for mechanism generation did allow the user to select the level of lumping um, that was re required from the scheme. Um, the other area where lumping has been um, applied successfully is in um, predicting soot formation, so the so-called hacker reaction sequence. Um, so here um, we're describing polymerization cycles um, which are representing particle growth, soot formation. Um, so first of all, we have um, hydrogen abstraction reaction, and then we've got the um, addition of acetylene, and we've what you can see from this is that these are going through cycles, and each time we go around a cycle, we're adding a carbon. Um, but all the, all the cycles are structurally the same types of reactions. Um, and so there's different levels of lumping that we can apply here. Um, if we um, define a lump which, well, the most severe lumping um, is basically to sum together all the species um, into a single lump, uh, M0, so that's just the sum of concentrations of all of the species in the scheme. Um, and that one-dimensional system is just going to describe the evolution of the total PAH concentration. But we lose uh, details of the dynamics in the system here. So it's a, a little bit over-severe. Um, the other approach is to... Um, multiply each of the equations by an integer which kind of corresponds to the molecular mass of the species, i.e. the number of carbons, and then sum the terms. So, you know, is this a chemical lumping or mathematical lumping? It's probably both. They're equivalent in this case. Um, so in this, in this case, then, um, we end up with um, the first moment of the PAH distribution. So we've got three lumped species now which are weighted sums of the uh, individual species types in the reaction sequence. So, you know, we, s we lose a huge number of variables from the overall problem by, by lumping these together. And that's the um, lump reaction system. I'm rather aware now that we're running to the end of time. <laughs> ah, might get to the end. Um, so, just a general slide on, on, on mathematical lumping then. Um, in terms of um, formulation, what we're saying is, is that we start out with our initial um, set of rate equations for um, our chemical species, and then if we want to go through mathematical lumping, we're transforming our original variables to a new set of variables, in this case y hat, that would be um, of lower dimension uh, than the original set. So in this formulation, this is a nonlinear transformation, um, but I would say probably most applications of mathematical lumping have been uh, of uh, linear nature. So if we go through this transformation, then we get a new set of variables um, describing the rate of change of y hat with time, and this will be of much lower dimension um, than the first if, um, if we go through an effective lumping process. So for linear lumping, that's a bit easier to understand. Um, so we, it's simply a matrix multiplication um, where basically this matrix is non-square. So um, by applying this transformation, we end up with a lower dimensional system. So as an example here, um, we've got um, a four by two dimensional matrix. So what this is gonna do is transform our original variables, y1 to y4, into two lumped variables, y1 hat, y2 hat, um, which are, well, the, the y1 is just the same as, as, as y1 hat, and y2 is just the linear sum of the three other concentrations. Okay, so um, math, conceptually, that's how all lumping works, I suppose. It's just that for chemical lumping, we're actually using our um, intuitive chemical knowledge of the system to describe how this matrix is being formulated. I think this is the last part. Oh, I've got time to go through it. Um, so the last part is, um, if, if all of this isn't enough <laughs> to get our chemical models into um, the CFD model 
um, that we want to use to simulate our device, then maybe we have to kind of abandon um, the, the, the chemical um, nature of the way in which de we're describing the chemistry. So we're not going to describe the chemistry as, as reactions. Um, we're just basically going to somehow encode the information on the chemical changes in some other way. Um, and there are various ways to do that. Um, we, can, we can fit the chemical changes as functional equations, uh, such as polynomials. Uh, we can tabulate um, information related to the chemical changes and then use lookup tables to access them during our CFD simulation. Um, or um, we can describe um, our chemical information in the form of flamelets. And so I'll just say one or two things about each of these. So in fitted models, um, what we're doing here is, is taking the chemical changes over a time step, and instead of using integration methods within our CFD code, we're, doing, we're going to do that offline, and then we're going to fit um, those chemical changes using some much um, less expensive model, something like a, a polynomial model maybe, for example, um, and store that and access um, the fitted model during the simulation instead of solving the chemical rate equations. So why does this work? Well, all of these methods work really because in CFD codes, um, where you've got millions of cells, it's very likely that you're visiting um, the same conditions in terms of composition, temperature, and pressure many, many times within that CFD simulation. So uh, why solve the chemical integration equations every time? And once you've solved them once, you've already got that information that you can then reuse. Um, so um, it might be quicker to just store the model as a, as a simple polynomial model um, and reuse it later. Um, I mean, obviously, tabulation methods are also doing this, you know, basically tabulating chemical rates of change um, for different compositions, temperatures, pressures, and then um, reusing that, that tabulation later. Um, well, there's, uh, there's been lots of uh, different approaches to, um, um, to these fitted models. So orthonormal polynomials always come up when we're fitting um, response surfaces. I mean, I don't know. Some people are interested in, in artificial uh, intelligence, right? So neural networks have also been used in this context as well. Um, uh, they, they kind of boil down to the same thing. They're just clever ways of fitting uh, the rate of the chemical rate of change over a time step um, and um, providing that model for, for later use. Um, so this is an example of... Well, we, we applied in, uh, both an orthonormal or polynomial and a neural network to a, to a model for um, uh, wet CO mixtures. Um, and actually, all of these models are exploiting the low-dimensional manifolds that I talked about earlier. So in this case, what we found was is that the whole system collapses onto a four-dimensional um, um, manifold very quickly. And so to create this fitted model, we only actually need four variables. Um, and so once you've fitted these chemical rates of change for the four um, slow variables, then simulating the model is, is extremely rapid. Um, so the, the, the caveats to this are that your, your fitting has to be, of course, very um, accurate. Um, and actually, in ignition systems, that's even more important because um, there are regions in, in, in the phase space where the trajectories come together very closely. Um, but a tiny error in the fitting of the model here could lead to um, a rapid divergence, actually, in the trajectories at some other point as, the, as a system um, uh, m moves through the composition space. So trajectories can converge at some points of composition space and then diverge um, in other places. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the difference between um, techniques like PRISM and, and offline techniques that I've just been talking about are that they are trying to do the fitting in situ 
Um, and actually, there's, a, there's um, kind of an advantage here, I suppose, in that they can be incorporated into um, any CFD code with any starting chemistry that you might have. And so um, the, the piecewise re reusable map technique is saying, OK, well, I'm going into, I'm in a particular grid cell of my CFD code, and I've got a certain composition, temperature, pressure, saying, well, okay, have I seen that before? No. Then I will solve the chemical um, equations. I will integrate the chemical equations and, and, um, and store the information. Um, um, but if I have seen it before, um, then, well, or if I see enough of it, I can fit um, a polynomial model that describes the rate of change, and then the next time I vi revisit that region, I can use the polynomial model instead of solving or integrating the chemical rate equations. Um, and so um, this is based on a kind of grid or a hypercube. So once you've got enough um, solutions of the chemical rate equations to fit your polynomial, you then don't need in that particular hypercube to, fit, to, to actually solve those equations again. Um, so it, it's about kind of reusing information. Um, let me skip forward. So in situ tabulation also um, follows this approach. And again, it's exploiting the fact that during reactive flow calculations, these regions of composition space are going to be revisited many times. So again, the first time, um, we're going to solve the chemistry and, and store it. And then the next time, we're going to say, well, do we have, um, do we have a stored um, value that's, that's good enough to use, or do we need to solve the chemical rate equations again? Um, so if we have a stored value, or, or if we're close to where the stored value was, we can just use an interpolation technique. Um, uh, but if we're a long way away from any information we've got stored, then we might need to solve uh, the system fully. So as you go through the simulation, of course, you've got more and more stored data um, until eventually you can just use the store and retrieve algorithm and the whole process will speed up the simulation. Um, so this is, again, just about controlling the fitting error, really. But this has been successfully used in a large number of, of turbulent reactive flows. Um, and I think it's even encoded into um, uh, things like open foam. Um, to use. Oh, how are we doing? Um, flamelets is another um, kind of inf information storage method. So here, well, you know, if in, the, in our CFD code, we might be trying to solve uh, for a turbulent flame front. Um, but what flamelets are doing is saying, well, actually, each part of... Um, uh, that wrinkle flame front um, can be represented by a flamelet. Um, and that flamelet information um, can be um, simulated and then st and stored just using a simple um, 1D simulation code, like a 1D um, counterflow laminar flame code. So we can use 1D simulations with detailed chemistry to store flamelets for different... Um, regions of composition, temperature, and pressure space. And then we can use those in the turbulent simulation um, through the use of lookup tables. Okay, and this, has been, this approach has been used, um, coupled with um, PDF, probability density function type simulations for turbulent, uh, for turbulent flames quite successfully. Um, so the advantages, are, uh, I suppose, of well, not just flamelets, but all of these simulation codes, uh, these storage-type methods, are that they, um, they're usually quite rapid, um, and they can be, therefore, easily coupled with CFD packages um, using a range of different turbulence modeling approaches. Um, for flamelets particularly, we can use detailed chemistry in developing those t tables, and the same is true for ISAT, um, so that we can avoid using highly reduced um, me um, mechanistic representations like global reactions. Um, the disadvantages are that they, they sometimes can fail in areas where we've got uh, significant flame stretch, for example, or where we've got very intense small-scale turbulence. Um, 
And it's difficult to estimate the errors that are induced by um, those the, the fitting assumptions um, unless we compare with uh, techniques like direct numerical simulation. Um, I would also say that you know, if you're using fitted models, uh, again, you need to know where the chemistry for the flamelet came from. So you can generate your own flamelets using up-to-date chemistry, but, but some of the flamelet libraries may not necessarily include the most up-to-date chemistry for the fuel that you're interested in. Um, so final considerations then on that very rapid gallop through model reduction techniques. Um, so it it's really depends on your, your research goals, I suppose, how far you, you might want or need to go in terms of um, reducing the representation of, of chemistry. If you're probing the kinetics, um, then you know, just using skeletal model reduction might be as far as you need or want to go because you want to retain the chemical nature of the representation of your scheme. Um, if, you, if your goal is to simulate reactive turbulent combustion, then um, tabulation or fitting might be the only thing you can afford um, if you want to include detailed chemistry. Um, and actually, it, it would be useful if these techniques were, were more readily available in commercial codes, I think. Um, I suppose a point of advice is that you should always be aware of what the underlying chemistry is whether you're using a table, a flamelet, or a, a global reaction model, where does the chemistry come from? Is it up to date? Uh, when was it created? Um, if you're using a global reaction scheme, have you got sufficient intermediates to represent the chemistry for your problem? And are the underlying rate constants up to date? Always check. Um, if you're using fitted models, always make sure that you've used a really broad range of Compositions, temperatures, pressures to fit them. So be, wor be wary about over-extrapolating models that you've fitted. Um, and, you know, if you can afford to track uncertainties, okay, it's expensive, we discuss the methods, but um, always do that because it will tell you if your model is robust um, and it might tell you where, you know, to focus your efforts on, on reducing models. I think this is my... Oh, no, it's not my final slide. Oh, yeah, my final message is we need to get a move on because we've got to get to net zero by 2050. <laughs> so whatever we're doing, let's, let's all try and focus on, um, on you know, low-carbon combustion and uh, or, um, solving problems of climate change. Um, this just made me laugh, actually. A friend of mine bought me a book. Uh, it's called Fully Automated Luxury Communism. And uh, it's, it, it's supposed to be about the life we should all be having, that basically everything's automated and, and all the spoils of the automation are shared between us and so we can just relax and we, we only have to work when we want to, uh, etc. It's, it's not what life's like at all, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but actually, I thought it was quite a good analogy for um, the combustion kinetics communities. Um, you know, what, what, wouldn't it be nice if we were able to automate our labs and have, you know, high throughput, uh, of our labs, um, choose our experiments carefully through design of experiments and, and get the, gather the data we need to improve our models for our, um, our low carbon uh, combustion devices, to automatically share our data um, for evaluation and optimization of our, of our models um, and do that effectively. Um, to do automated theory calculations. Well, actually, um, there are groups actually working on that already. And again, share all that data for everyone to use to improve their model accuracy, automate optimization and uh, reaction reduction. And then we can really crack on in solving um, the grand challenge problems that need to be solved by 2050. Um, yeah, well, that's you know, a nice vision of w the future. <laughs> Whether it's possible is a, a different thing. But collaboration is clearly always the key. Well, thanks to all of you for sticking through to the very end. Um, that's me done. Great. <laughs>